Okay, so welcome everyone to Pollination Ecology. Um, I am Rebecca McMacken. Uh, I uh, am the director of horticulture at Brooklyn Bridge Park, where we manage 85 acres of urban landscape entirely organically, but not just organically. We also manage it ecologically. So a lot of the practices we do are with the populations of bees, butterflies, um, flies, reptiles in mind. Um, and, uh, and one important element uh, in order to develop those techniques and practice those techniques is really understanding the groups of organisms that we're working for and with. And um, pollination ecology is just my favorite topic in the whole world. It combines, I think, um, the most beautiful stuff in the world, which is flowers and sex, and also these incredible ecological processes that are really uh, invisible to the vast majority of people. And gardeners and farmers are in this incredibly unique position. We're all in this wonderful position where we are really capable of witnessing this stuff firsthand. When you start to realize what's happening, when you know the players, and you just sort of start paying attention, this whole world opens up. And it can be a really incredible, wonderful process just to start watching who is visiting your flowers. Um, in your and eating your leaves um, in your gardens and on your farms. So um, <clears throat> uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is going to be Facebook Live. Hello, Internet. Um, unfortunately, I have a cold, <laughs> and so I'm going to be coughing and hopefully not blowing my nose into the microphone. But if it gets horrible, I'm going to try and take a break. There's going to be two big sessions. We're going to have a break in the middle. Uh, feel free to ask questions uh, as we go along. There's going to be some big sections uh, to the to the um, to the session. Uh, we're going to talk about what pollination is and really get some uh, definitions down. We're going to talk about why it's important, um, and then we're going to talk about who the pollinators are. We're going to go through the major groups of pollinators. Unfortunately, this time of the year, there's really just flies outside. Usually, maybe a honeybee or two. You would know better than I. Um, but um, th this will be great information for you to be able to go into the field with in the spring. And then we're going to talk about creating pollinator habitats, um, what things you can do on a farm and a garden in order to encourage more, more diverse, more specialized pollinators on your landscapes. And then we're going to go over food crops and the pollination syndromes of common food crops and what you can do to encourage those pollinators in your landscapes. So who is a farmer who's actively farming right now? OK, great. All right. And then who's ever taken a pollination ecology or pollination course before? OK, awesome. That's wonderful. And maybe with Xerxes Society? Yep. OK, they're wonderful. So my background, I have a, a, a background in ecology, but um, I'm not a bee scientist. And there are people who are teaching amazing courses in this stuff like Xerxes, um, and there's a list of resources on your handouts, um, and maybe we'll post them on the internet for the internet. Um, but um, there are people, this is really like a popular science version of all of that nitty gritty information where um, <clears throat> hopefully it's really accessible, and then I'll give you the resources to go and dig deeper into really, um, you know, we're gonna talk about uh, big groups of like, um, leaf cutting insects as a whole or leaf cutting bees as a whole and then you'll be able to like drill down into species if that's something you're really passionate about doing and Xerxes is a great place to to do that as well. Um, so yeah um, let's get started. Any questions about the format? Anything like that? No? Okay great. Why is pollination important? Um, we all know that um, a third of food that we eat is the direct result of pollination, right? Fruit, usually. Um, and, um, uh, <clears throat> and the services, pollination services, like ecological services, um, are, are very, very valuable to humanity. They're, they're very, very critical um, uh, parts of how we survive on this planet. Um, so there's a very selfish rationalization for understanding this stuff. And it's really critical that we do understand it because there are places in the world where um, pollinators have been totally wiped out. This is in China, where their chemical usage and environmental pollution are so bad that they literally need to hand pollinate apples in certain regions because they just don't have the bees to do it any longer. And 
I can't tell you how often, like once every six months, there's a new article that says, oh, check out this awesome little drone that's going to replace bees eventually um, as we wipe out the bees. And I, I don't think that we need to do that. I think there's plenty of techniques and that this is obviously an audience of people who is interested in doing that to stave off this sort of horrible dystopia. Um, but it's also kind of cynical, I think, to look at this incredible, these incredible dynamics and say, okay, they're valuable to humans and that's why they're valuable to uh, protect. They're also valuable because they are organisms on planet Earth and they have integrity in and of themselves. And 80% um, of flowering plants are animal pollinated. So when you love a plant and um, you wipe out its pollinator, you're also uh, often, depending on which plant it is, wiping out that plant as well. Plants rely, these are dynamics. Organisms do not live in these little bubbles, right? They have these interconnected relationships with other organisms in the soil, their seed distributors. Pollination is just one part of the way that all of these organisms tie in together in a web. Um, and also, um, <clears throat> the uh, seeds and fruit that plants uh, produce are uh, very critical for birds. 25% of bird mammal diet is, again, directly related to pollination. But more importantly, 90% of uh, terrestrial birds in this country feed their, bir feed their uh, young on insects alone. And those insects are often pollinators. And so a lot of people in this realm like to think that we're you know, really encouraging and cultivating these, uh, these pollinators so that birds can eat them. And that's a really legitimate part of the work that we do is to try and create these robust ecosystems so that there's room for them to get eaten. Um, and as I was saying, it's just this amazing thing, right? It's just this amazingly beautiful world that's really small. I think um, before I was sort of awakened to this stuff by Xerxes and others, um, when I saw something flying around, I would dismiss it as bee or fly or bumblebee and not really look at it. And that simple act of sort of tracing that organism and watching it land on a flower and seeing what it does and looking at it and just thinking to yourself, who are you? What are you doing? And watching what it does that alone is just gonna tell you way more than I could ever tell you in this class, right? It's just that process of observation and becoming familiar with these organisms. Um, and a lot of this stuff is really still unknown, there is the reality, is that these are organisms that are first starting to be studied. Um, their populations are unknown. You may have heard recently that in Germany, um, in one specific forest, they found that 75% of invertebrates are gone, that their populations are so far, I mean, it's like, you know, apocalyptic numbers in the insect world are happening right now. We'll talk about monarchs. Um, and, um, and where in the United States and elsewhere in the world, often we don't know what the situation is only because we're not studying it and we're not looking, we don't have historical data for what those populations uh, used to look like that we can compare modern populations. And then when you get into the things like life cycle and ecology and behavior, all of that stuff is really a mystery as well. And one of the, you know, sort of silver linings of the whole colony collapse disorder is that it's caused a lot more research into native bee species than I've ever personally seen. Um, so we're starting to really understand this stuff a lot. But again, you as a person sitting amongst a field of sunflowers or alfalfa or what have you, you have a very unique perspective for your own, for your own education, but also um, for the broader world, any observations that you make could be, could be novel, right? Like this is all really exciting, exciting and sexy stuff. And look at this beautiful bee. Like that's the thing, right? Like they're gorgeous. The metallic bees are incredible. Some of the bees, some of, we'll look at longhorn bees. They're so cute. And so many of these bees are so friendly and, and like they will let you pet them and pick them up. And so it's really just, we're really big organisms, right? We're like these giant lumbering things. And these are all really tiny things. And so just, just putting them on your radar and focusing on them really, really opens up your world to these incredible, incredible animals and what they do in the world. So first we're gonna look at, um, <clears throat> at what pollination is. So this is our, our lily flower. And, um, and so I'm sure this is all review, but uh, for the sake of review, um, there's male, female parts. This is what we call a perfect, a perfect flower that has um, both male parts and female parts. And it, not all flowers do, we'll talk about that, but in this one it does. So the male parts are right here. We've got the stamen is the male organ, and it has the filament, which is this stick, and then the anther. And the anther is a little sack of pollen that dihesses, it dries out and opens up and releases the pollen, and that's essentially the sperm. 
um, for, the, for the plant. And then that needs to get onto the female part of the plant, which is right here. This is the female part right here. Um, and this is the carpal. And the carpal consi uh, consists of um, the ov ovules, which are inside the receptacle, or the ovary, I'm sorry, right here. Um, and that's where the seeds are growing. Um, and then this we'll talk about a lot. This is the stigma. And the stigma is um, the receptive female part of the plant where the anther, where the pollen needs to land on. Um, the pollen needs to get to that stigma. The stigma is often sticky and wet. Um, the pollen gets dried out on its journey oftentimes and the stigma rehydrates it. Um, and then that pollen, if it's lucky, will then germinate on that stigma just the same way a seed germinates. That pollen germinates and it grows a long tube that grows down the style into the ovary and then into an ovule. And again, if it's lucky, it gets to pollinate one of those ovules. And that's how that process works. Um, so pollination, what we're going to talk about, that's pollination is only the process by which that pollen lands on that stigma. And then once it lands on the stigma, what happens after that, the germination, et cetera, that's fertilization. So that's a completely separate topic. We are simply talking about this move from here to here, boom, boom. And that's plant sex, essentially. And that's an incredibly complicated process, as we will see. There's many different methods of, of doing that. Um, there's different types of, of, um, of pollination. We're going to talk a lot about animal-mediated uh, pollination, bees, butterflies, et cetera. But there's also wind, water, and then self-pollination. Um, and we'll talk about wind. We'll talk about selfing. Um, but, um, but animals are the big one. Um, wind is also really critical in agriculture, and we'll, we'll talk about that as well. Um, so again, this is, this is a rose. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with this flower. Um, it's, again, this is a perfect flower in the botanical uh, terminology. And you can see all these little anthers around the edge right here. And you can see that this is the uh, stigma section here. Um, and when a bee comes and visits, uh, they'll pick up this pollen and fly to another flower and then um, hopefully move that um, ready uh, pollen to a receptive, a receptive stigma. And you can look really closely. If this were um, a different season, we would be able to look at some flowers and look at their anthers and see which ones were actually dihessing. Um, I always carry a hand lens with me, which is just like a pocket magnifying glass. It's a really wonderful tool. I encourage everyone to always have them. Um, but you can see these processes in action. And you can see most plants do not release all of their pollen all at once. They time it out so that they can um, get the most distribution humanly possible. It's also in the, um, the interests of plants, most plants as well, um, to try and get their pollen uh, as far away from themselves as possible and onto a different individual as themselves. Some, some plants will self and they will self-pollinate and so their genes aren't going anywhere. Um, but most plants have strategies, uh, they've evolved strategies in which they um, will not self-pollinate or that self-pollinating is just a last resort, it's something they do after they've been open um, to pollinators for, for hours or days, then they will go ahead and as the flower closes up, the anthers will go ahead and touch that stigma as sort of a last, as a last resort, but they've been open for a while. One way that plants do this is, whoops, is, by, um, is by timing. So there's, there's different ways that they can keep their own anthers away from their own stigmas. They can have the pollen released first and then have the, a receptive stigma only much later so that they're not, they're not able um, to um, fertilize themselves. Sometimes they will um, use space to keep those two organs away from each other where the anthers will be way up here and the stigma will be way down here or opposite. Um, a lot of, we'll look at pine trees and how they do that. Um, and then sometimes they'll have male and female flowers on different plants, uh, like this begonia. Um, they have on one plant, they'll have male and female flowers. I'm sorry, um, there's, there are, we'll look at other plants where, that have um, male and female, female flowers on different individuals. So something like hollies, right? Hollies, you have male shrubs and female shrubs. Um, and you have to make sure if you want berries, you have to make sure that you have, same with pawpaws, you have to make sure you have differently sexed individuals in order to get fruit. Um, <clears throat> whereas something like a begonia um, has male and female flowers on the same plants, but those flowers are not perfect. They have just male flowers and just female flowers. 
So you can see here this flower is made up of different anthers, and this one is just a bundle of stigmas. Um, so there's all different sorts of strategies. You know, it's one of those things where if it works for something, they just go with it. There's not any one best strategy for plants for um, uh, that diverse sexual reproduction. D was that clear? That got a little jumbled. That makes sense. Okay, anytime you have a question, just yell it out. It's fine. Um, it, but we'll just make sure everybody's um, <clears throat> together as we, as we move along. Um, so... Um, there's also a lot of um, a lot of flowers that are um, in uh, the family Asteraceae, which are the composites, um, and uh, and they are made up of thousands, if not hundreds, of uh, little what we call florets. This is a sunflower, and if you look closely at it, rather than just having one flower with one set of anthers and one stigma. It's made up this beautiful um, swirl of, of hundreds, if not thousands, of them. And each individual floret has its own anthers and its own stigma. And they, they have the strategy. These are all perfect flowers. They have the strategy where the, um, the male reproductive cycle goes first, and then the female reproductive cycle goes second. And so um, <clears throat> you, can you can see this happening. And that's one of the benefits of having a hand lens. When you look at a sunflower, you just look closely. And you'll see these like incredible little rings of yellow, and that's the ring that the pollination is happening in. So, but this is just to say that the flower shapes are diverse. Um, that this is uh, this is just a, a set of hundreds of flowers um, in one flower called the composites. And here's a echinacea that we're I'm sure we're all familiar with. It was not abundantly obvious, and for those of you who just came in, I work in horticulture, right? Like that's my realm, and I do not work in agriculture, although I dabble, like most good people in Brooklyn. Um, I, um, so the vast majority of my examples are going to come from horticulture, and then I'm going to get into some um, agricultural plants to talk about their pollination syndromes um, at the end. But anytime you have something that you feel like would be an important part of how this relates to agriculture, I would love to hear about that. Um, because a lot of the, you know, when I'm talking about apple pollination, et cetera, that's research that I've gleaned from the internet. That is not my personal experience. And so if you have experience with that, please speak up and this can be more of a discussion. Um, but all of these, obviously, all of these uh, relationships are, are universal to these flower types. So you can see here on this echinacea um, that this is a composite flower, that these are all individual uh, little florets, and that this ring here, this is all the male flowers blooming right here. And if you watch these bees, as I'm sure you're all going to go out into the world and do now, um, when they go and visit these flowers, they do this little walk, which we should all come up with a fun name for, where they just do this little ring walk around the outside and they pollinate all of these florets. And they, every flies do it, bees do it, bumblebees do it. Um, on the echinacea, it's very, very obvious. Another thing to notice here is that this ring of florets is around the outside. And, um, <clears throat> and this disc of this coneflower is really flat. Um, this is when they first open up, they're very flat, and the, the flat florets that are blooming are all along the outside. And then later in the season, as those outside florets are pollinated, as the seeds within the coneflower start to grow, that cone starts to mound up, and the petals kind of bend back and reflex a little bit as well. And so then it becomes, it morphs into the coneflower that we know and love. And you can really see that movement, right? That behavior where in the plant, the flower itself is transforming because the seeds are growing within it and you get this lovely cone. And then the florets that are blooming, it starts on the outside and works its way in. And then by the end of the season, you just have this tiny little ring at the top. And that's, those are the only flowers left that are blooming and all of the bees that visit it are just doing this tiny little circle on each plant and marching around. Um, marching around those florets and pollinating them that way. So I think that that's, I think one of the most fun parts of pollination ecology is thinking about the movements of these plants over time, right? Our sense of time and plants' sense of time and insects' sense of time are all really, really different. And so when you can see these movements and these behaviors of plants, it can really make them come alive in a way that I don't think most people relate to plants in that fashion. They don't see them as actual organisms with desires and languages. And these are the ways, I think, especially through pollination, these are the ways that these plants are literally communicating and expressing, you know, their desires in life. Yeah. Um, so for like a flower, that's a flower that's pollinating kind of like throughout its whole season. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Whereas like the other ones might just pollinate, like they just really simple one size. Right? That's a great point. So um, it's, it's totally different depending on the plant. Um, but you're absolutely right that the, um, the cone flowers have a strategy that they're able to pollinate over the course. They're able to, um, you know, feed the, the bee populations, et cetera, over the course of months. And that's why a lot of people love to plant echinacea is because it has this really long flowering period and the, the sterile uh, rays around the perimeter, what most people think of as the flower, are very, very persistent because that flower wants to be attractive for that entire length of time. It's still trying to be attractive throughout the entire time. Whereas there are other flowers with much more brief and intense pollination windows where, um, where they, uh, they even <clears throat> if you think about a pine tree, right? There's like two days where your car is covered in pine pollen and then it's done. That, that's, um, that's a very, very brief window. Um, and a, just a completely different strategy, right? So some people try and flood the, environment with pollen and it's a crazy orgy and then some people try and slowly slowly some people some plants try and slowly slowly I'm like queen of anthropomorphosis and I understand that it's not technically correct but it's it makes it a, a lot easier and it's quite frankly it's how I relate to plants I'm one of those people that scientists are always like stop um, and and also another point to that um, being that this is, I'm so happy that um, this conference gave me three hours. I usually do this class in like 45 minutes, which is an impossible feat if any of you have been in it. It's like ridiculous. It's also impossible to teach it in three hours. That is, I'm not gonna finish everything. And so there's, after the break, we'll come back and there might be a bit of a choose your own adventure element where we get to pick what I talk about for the last, um, the last session. But there's, if you have specific things that you wanna know about, there's a good chance that I won't have time to talk about them, so make sure that you um, tell me what you want to hear about as we go along. Yeah. It's interesting to see how the uh, bees pollination behavior changes in uh, how the cone flowers bloom. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about how uh, the, the behavior uh, of pollinators changes based on what the needs are of the colony or the hive itself. Oh, sure. Absolutely, we'll talk about that. I think the right time to talk about that is where we talk about especially bumblebee reproduction, um, which we'll get into, and thank you for bringing that up. It does change drastically. If you're a queen bumblebee waking up first thing in the spring, you need something very different than if you're a worker bee bringing back resources to grow your next generation of sisters, right? So we'll ta thank you for bringing that up, and we'll, we'll definitely touch on that when we get into the cycles of the bees themselves. Yes, absolutely. We'll talk about that specifically with certain flowers um, and what the functionality of each of those resources are. We'll talk about nectar um, and, um, and pollen and then also fun stuff as well like oils and heat and things that plants use as um, lures. Um, so this is, uh, does anyone recognize this flower? This is a soy flower. <clears throat> so, um, and this is a, a really different type of a flower, right? Very, very different. Um, it's that kind of a lock and key mechanism compared to something like a composite, which is really open, and that's a generalist flower, right? That's something that's just open. You could be a fly, you could be a butterfly. So many different kinds of um, animals can visit those really open flowers. Very few animals can figure out what the hell to do with this kind of a flower, and, um, and that's the way this flower wants it. And in fact, soy, is not really known to have a pollinator. Soy is one of these flowers that relies mostly on selfing. So for whatever reason, in, in the evolutionary history of this plant and the cultivation of this plant as well, um, this is a flower that has, um, has found that it is most beneficial to clone itself over time and to not rely on sexual reproduction. And that happens. There are certain flowers that, um, that never even open or that bloom underground, that are never pollinated or very, very rarely pollinated. The conditions that they were growing in were one in which their pollinators just weren't available. Um, and so they developed these other strategies for reproduction that were not reliant on, on pollinators. And there's a lot of flowers um, that I work with, a lot of plants that I work with that are um, as simple as like a lot of mints, right? A lot of mints will, um, they are so popular with the bees, right? Super, super popular. 
but their sexual reproduction is actually quite rare because they mostly rely on rhizomatous reproduction. They mostly just rely on spreading out and cloning themselves. So different plants have just completely different strategies. There is a full spectrum of reproductive strategies. And some, some plants, it's in their best interest to self. Um, in general, it seems to be the case that sexual reproduction is uh, most beneficial for organisms. That that's, that is something that <clears throat> when they have the opportunity to take advantage of it, they do, simply because they can mix up those genes. We do it, you know, it's obviously, it's obviously beneficial for a number of reasons, but when it's not an option, it can mean the difference between extinction and, um, and continued existence when you have a backup me mechanism for self-reproduction. Um, and then this is a pea flower that, um, that again, has that same kind of morphology as, um, as the soy, and they also have very limited um, pollination, and when they are pollinated, it's usually by bumblebees. And they have this, it's a really complex pollination strategy, um, and it doesn't want just anyone visiting it, right? Like this is, this is a, a crazy puzzle to get into, and what they have is, um, they have this thing called a banner right here, which is this, this wing, um, and then a keel right here, which is almost like um, a trap door. And, um, and you can do this the next time you run into a pea flower from any, any kind of um, pea plant. You can push on this keel, and I used to have a video in here, but video in PowerPoint is like a whole a horrible thing. Um, but when you push on this keel right here, what happens is that these are two uh, petals that are protecting like this, the anthers and the stigma of the flower. And when that keel gets pushed down, these also kind of open in a very beautiful, elegant manner. And the re reproductive organs of the flower just kind of push out and up um, in this very beautiful way. And so the weight of that bumblebee, it needs to have a specific weight. This is like um, uh, Indiana Jones, um, where it has to have a very specific weight. Um, and it pushes this down, and then the bees are able to get access to the pollen and the nectar of that flower. And again, like this is something that you can go to your grocery store or florist shop and just and do this and be that strange lady who does that, like me, and will spread all around. <laughs> um, but this is just to say that certain 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 plants are generalists and they want everyone to pollinate them, and certain ones are specialists and they have really specific, there's benefits to the strategy, right? It might be more exclusive, but you know that the bumblebee that's visiting you uh, is only probably gonna be visiting you in this region. It's not gonna be jumping from flower to flower to flower. It's a specialist. Um, and uh, you know also, again, anthropomorphization, but you know as the flower, you know that this is a bumblebee that Bumblebees are really beneficial because they have a long distance that they can fly compared to a lot of bees. Um, and they pollinate throughout a, a very long season as well. So there's, there's a benefit for making those relationships, for hooking up with certain organisms and tying those relationships together um, rather than just being a generalist. And again, it's, um, it's whatever works. Um, does anyone recognize this flower? The amorphophallus, the stinkhorn. Um, and so this is a completely different kind of a flower. Um, and, um, and this one is given, we talked about pollen and we'll talk about nectar. Um, this flower gives off heat and, um, and stinks because it's attracting flies, which we'll talk about as well. But it's a very, very different, um, different shape of a flower and it's, um, it's actually mimicking rotting meat. Um, and so again, it takes, takes all kinds in this world. Um, <clears throat> And then does anyone recognize this flower? Skunk cabbage. This is, I think, arguably, with pussy willow, maybe our first flowering plant in the spring. Um, and so I think a lot of people are familiar with this like exotic heat giving off arum and wow, that's so cool. And sometimes, but obviously not in this crowd, um, less familiar with a flower that does the exact same thing but is abundant in this ecosystem, which is the skunk cabbage flower that blooms so early in the spring and it creates this little house um, and it attracts flies, and sometimes you can even find a little melted snow ring around this flower because it's literally giving off heat. And if you're a fly um, in February or March, finding a little warm room to hang out in and eat in is amazing. So these flowers are not just giving away these resources, they're also creating habitat. They're creating places to live, they're creating places to mate, um, they're creating places for these animals to hang out. 
Um, and then these fly pollinated plants, they're also, what they do as, as meat mimics, they give off this stench. Um, and then they also, the coloration, that purple and white is, um, is meant to mimic the modeling on meat itself. It's like the fat and the muscle, um, which I just think is awesome. <laughs> uh, and yeah, and again, you can see this in action, right? So next in the spring, go out and you'll see these little flies hanging out in here. And they're so fortunate to be living in this little rotten meat house, uh, this hot <laughs> rotten meat house that the skunk cabbage has created for them. Does anyone recognize this flower? It's a very important flower. It is an orchid. It's a vanilla orchid. So this is where vanilla comes from, is this flower. Um, and there's a wonderful story about, that I won't have time to get into, but about the distribution of vanilla and the, um, the, uh, the um, uh, in cultivation of vanilla all over the world and how difficult it was to move it around because they didn't have the pollinator uh, situation worked out. They couldn't figure out, and they were hand, and still today, often it's a hand pollinated flower um, when you're dealing with vanilla production um, in, a, in an agricultural setting. You're not dealing with the wild, wild pollinators, which are these guys, these are stingless bees. Um, and uh, there's lots of pop really marvelous populations of these guys in tropical regions all over the world. And some of them are, um, are also makers of honey. Um, are our honeybees, the world's honeybees, Apis mellifera, um, they are one of a few species of bees that make honey. Um, and uh, this honey is very rare. There's problems with it, uh, with you know, people over harvesting it and harming these populations of stingless bees. Um, but it's a really rare and special thing. Has anyone ever tried it before? It's amazing. It's like, it's, I, I went to Costa Rica one time and I found them and my husband had to hold me back from like ripping apart their hive to get to it. And it wasn't the right season, so I could have just like killed these poor bees. And I didn't, because my husband is smarter than I am. Um, <clears throat> but you can sometimes find it. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, <clears throat> it's very different than honeybee honey. Um, it's a little like muskier, sort of like duck versus chicken. Um, and it's, it's uh, <clears throat> pr uh, supposedly has a lot of the same really, and, and different, really incredible um, uh, microbial compounds uh, as well. It's just amazing stuff. Mm. Okay. And then there's, um, <clears throat> these are longhorn bees, which we'll talk about uh, more and get into their uh, life cycle. But you can see what they're doing here. These are a bunch of males who are sleeping. Um, and I have these guys in my garden, and they are so cute. And they, they all, I have on my Instagram account, if you want to follow it, I post all these videos of like, they'll fight each other during the day. They'll all pick a flower. I have uh, Rudbeckia maxima, um, the giant cone flower. Um, and they all will fight each other all day for the cone flower because they think that's where the females are going to land. And they spend all day, these little bees, just like banging into each other, fighting each other. And then the sun goes down and they all cozy up right next to each other and go to sleep. And then they wake up in the morning and do it again and they fight. And it's just this adorable, and they're so cute. They're like these fuzzy little sweeties and they're really friendly. Um, <clears throat> Uh, flowers are also places for predators to hunt, right? Like obviously if this crab spider knows that all of these pollinators are going to come, um, that's a great place to hang out. And crab spiders are really incredible in that they um, can shift color to match the color of their flower. Um, so it's usually from um, white to yellow, but on daffodils especially you can find these guys um, and they often match really well. The best way to find crab spiders is not to look for a crab spider, but to look for an unusually still insect. Um, anytime I see a bee that's just sitting there and not moving at all, you can look closely and often you will find that someone is in the process of eating it. And it can be a crab spider or a wheel bug or an assassin bug. Flowers can be really incredible sites to watch these little tiny like incredible, uh, you know, uh, wars play out. I have a toddler who's just amazed, you know, he's into dinosaurs now. And watching that kind of stuff on a micro scale on a flower is something that kids uh, really, really get into. Um, it's also a great place to have sex. Um, <clears throat> and they are often, bees especially are, are often, and like every, every organism is often uh, having sex on a flower. And there's obvious reasons for that as well, right? The males are, are looking for those places where the females are gonna visit 
And that's the flowers, especially with bees. Females are the ones who are gathering the pollen, gathering the nectar to bring back to their <clears throat> nests. And so the males know that they can reliably find them there. Um, and then flowers also, if you think about it, um, for a lot of these early morning, cool season um, pollinators, a flower is kind of like a, um, a, uh, a satellite dish that is catching the sun and can heat up. The surface of the flower is often a few degrees to a few dozen degrees hotter than the ambient temperature. And so again, it's just a great place to hang out. And a lot of different bumblebees will, will sleep. They will make these uh, places their homes, especially flowers like mallows. We'll talk about squash flowers. Anything with like a big tube that has kind of like a large space in the middle of it, you can often early in the morning find bees asleep in there. And they, they're really cute when you, especially bumblebees, when you pet them, they like, they lift up one leg and they're like, stop, stop, I'm sure. I'm like a professional pesterer of tiny animals. <laughs> um, but of course it was not always like this, right? Um, flowers evolved on this planet. Um, and right now I said, I mentioned that 80% of plants require a pollinator partner. Um, but of course, originally no plants required a pollinator partner. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, plants evolved at least uh, half a billion years ago, um, and they started uh, by producing spores. They climbed their way onto land. Uh, more and more, it's looking like they were able to do that with the help of uh, fungi. Um, but they got onto land and they started producing spores. Um, and they came from the water, like all life on Earth came from the water. And they developed their reproductive strategies in the water, right? Um, and then when they got to land, they had to figure out how to um, get a sperm to an egg on the land. And in the water, that happens by swimming, right? Sperm are swim. Our sperm swim. Every, all the sperm swim. That's what they do. They have tails. Um, and all land organisms needed to kind of figure out a way to replicate that aquatic cycle in a terrestrial habitat. So the first, the earliest plants, did it in the water, right? Like mosses and ferns, they still had, they still require moisture. Um, oftentimes they'll, they, they live in wet sites and the, um, the, the male and female parts will have to like swim along one frond and get to the next one or in these beautiful little micro rivulets in the soil. Um, so originally they just kept, even though they were on the land, they kept those aquatic processes. Um, <clears throat> but then of course there's air. And um, they needed to figure out a way, or they didn't need to, but eventually they did figure out a way um, to mimic those processes in the air. And what they did was um, to form um, the pollen that had a waxy coating um, that could fly through the air. And, um, and angiosperms, the flowering plants, uh, when they evolved, they just totally exploded all over the planet. Darwin called it an abominable mystery because they were essentially missing one day and then the vast majority of life on Earth uh, in just a few million years. Um, and so they, they really proliferated. There was something about uh, having a flower that really encouraged species diversity and proliferation all over the planet. Although it wasn't just having, flower, having a flower, truth be told, angiosperms, what really differentiates the flowering plants from the non-flowering plants isn't just the flower, it's also the fact that angiosperms have a seed. And so there's just this funny relationship that I don't understand exactly why it exists between seeds and flowers, that this whole, this whole world of seeds and flowers go together. And while having a flower is really beneficial for diversity and sexual reproduction and getting your genes farther out than like a wind pollinated or water pollinated plant is able to do, also having uh, your progeny encased in a seed is obviously incredibly useful, especially when you're dealing with meteors falling and uh, mass extinctions. That protection is something that really allowed the angiosperms to um, dominate the planet as well. Um, but <clears throat> Flowers did appear eventually, um, and, um, and the earliest flowers were things uh, like um, magnolias and water lilies and tulip trees are some of our first primitive flowers. They've been around for hundreds of millions of years. Um, and um, and they are, the number keeps on getting pushed back. Like every six months, the story comes out where they found a new um, pollinated flower in amber someplace, and, but right now they think that angiosperms evolved about 150 million years ago. 
Um, and that was also when dinosaurs really dominated. So you can imagine these beautiful flowers and T. rexes just kind of roaming the earth together. Um, and, and again, so there's, there's this seed benefit to angiosperms to the flowering plants. And then there's also this animal mediated pollination. Um, and, um, and it was incredibly beneficial if you think about uh, the dynamics of something that is um, wind pollinated or spore, uh, spore reproduced by spores, you're really relying on a geologically isolated group of organisms that um, are all just switching around. And once you introduce an, an actively intelligent agent into that dynamic, you can have genes that go from one population to another population. And you've got this sort of, this desire enters into it, right? Like this other organism's desire for um, what they want out of your resources. And that's, we'll talk about, but that's like essentially what gives us these gorgeous flowers. These are the, the, um, the manifested desires of all of these insects um, and birds and whatnot, what they want to see. You know, you think of insects as really being mechanically minded sometimes, but when you look at an orchid or, um, or a peony or all of these really, really stunningly beautiful flowers, um, those are, are literally just what the insects and the pollinators want to see and want to eat. And so it's just, it gives me a whole new level of appreciation um, for, for even wasps and flies and stuff like that. Um, so there's, um, <clears throat> so, and you could get a sense of how successful this strategy was um, when I tell you that right now there's 250,000 species of angiosperms of flowering plants on the planet. Does anyone want to take a guess of how many species of gymnosperms? There are on the planet, so things like pine trees, how many species? There's 250,000 angiosperms. What do you think for gymnosperms? Cone-bearing plants. Eight to 900. So you can really see, right, that it's just as far as reproduction goes, we're not talking about biomass, we're not talking about coverage on planet Earth, but as far as species diversity goes, having that flower, having that seed, the ability to um, have a mediated reproductive cycle is um, incredibly beneficial for diversity and speciation on the planet. Um, so originally when these first plants uh, evolved, their bees and wasps hadn't entered the picture. They, they didn't evolve yet. Um, there were just beetles. They were the only, and they're dragonflies and other stuff, early insects. Um, so our first, our first insect pollinated plants were, um, were beetle pollinated. And you can see that in the, in the flowers of something like a magnolia and a lotus. They're, they're big, they're robust, they're fleshy, and they need to be able to house a scarab beetle. Um, so people don't often think about beetles as pollinators, but they're the oldest and one of the most critical as well. And they really just, they didn't pollinate on purpose. Very few, if not one, organism pollinates on purpose. They're pollinating by accident as they eat the pollen or drink the nectar. In this case, there wasn't nectar. Um, the beetles were just eating pollen um, and making a mess. And in that process, they are pollinating the flowers. It's called mess and soil pollination um, because they, Apparently, and you can see this, if you look at a magnolia flower, they make a huge mess and they poop everywhere. And that's like, that's their pollination syndrome is, is making a mess and pooping. Um, and then there are wasps. Wasps um, uh, were around shortly after the beetles. Um, and wasps are carnivores. Um, wasps, where they feed their young, they feed them meat. Um, they often will uh, gather something like a katydid or a caterpillar and stun it um, and lay their eggs on top of it. Um, and so the larvae then eats this paralyzed organism um, or they're the, um, you know, the hornets eating your lunch um, on a picnic. Um, but they, their larvae are, are carnivores. That's the, one of the main delineations between bees and wasps. Um, but then there's this resource suddenly available. They're carnivores, but then all of a sudden there's pollen around. Um, and so they would be fools not to take advantage of this resource, and they do, they start eating. Um, and then along the line, some of these wasps start gathering that pollen, and rather than feeding their uh, young meat, they start making these pollen balls and laying their eggs on top of those pollen balls. And that lineage of wasps turned into bees. And so bees are essentially vegetarian wasps. And, um, and they, uh, they evolved very closely with flowers. 
So the flowers that we see, there's obviously a lot of different types of flower pollination, but bees and flowers have a very, very close, um, close relationship where they really evolved together. Um, and we can thank them uh, for a lot of, a lot of our flowers. Um, <clears throat> and they're the only animal, bees are really the only animal that gathers pollen on purpose. Right? So uh, even wasps that pollinate still to this day, they're doing it by accident. They're still just landing to eat or landing to fight. We'll talk about orchids. Um, but bees, the females, um, land specifically to gather pollen, bring it back to their nest, um, and feed it to their young. So anytime you see a bee on a flower gathering pollen, the males will sometimes land to eat. But anything that's actively gathering pollen, you know that's a female, that you're dealing with a female of all species. Um, and so there's different strategies um, uh, with, with the pollinators. We talked about those specialists, we talked about those generalist flowers that are open to a wide variety of different pollinators. And I just want to bring your attention to um, the, the specialness of specialization. Um, this is a bear claw poppy in Utah, and it's critically endangered. And of course, certain administrations have opened up this region to uh, ATV use. Um, and, uh, and it has one pollinator, and it has this tiny little bee um, that, it is, that it is its pollinator. And both of these two organisms are critically imperiled, and if one goes out, the other one's going to go out too. And right now, there's not enough of this little bee. They have found that honeybees can sort of pollinate this plant, but not very well. Um, and, um, and there's a good chance at some point with global warming that we'll lose both of these organisms. But you have to imagine at one point it made a lot more sense for that bee to specialize with this plant and that for that plant to specialize with this bee. At some point, um, th this was probably much more abundant and this was a good strategy for both of these organisms to get tied in together um, so that they, but it's, it is, this kind of specialization is, is unusually rare where one plant has one pollinator partner and, and that organism just visits that one plant. Usually, if you think about most flowers, they don't bloom for that long of a period of time. So one of the things that we talk about for farming or gardening for pollinators is to make sure that you have something blooming throughout the course of the entire season so that you don't just have, you know, apples, apple flowers blooming and the bees that you're having encouraging to live on your site, they can't just live for two weeks when those flowers are blooming. You need to have continuous food sources. So, um, so, um, so this level of specialization is incredibly, incredibly rare. Um, but it makes sense for certain organisms, and it's a very delicate, delicate relationship that can be easily disturbed by humanity or ecology or global warming, et cetera. Um, and then you see that also with butterflies. This is um, <clears throat> a, a butterfly called the Carner's Blue Butterfly, and this is a lupin plant. Is everyone familiar with lupin? Beautiful, it's a beautiful um, native uh, uh, legume and um, it's, uh, it's, it reproduces, it likes a dry, sunny environment. If you have land, just throw the seeds out and you'll get it, it's a beauty. Um, it's a fantastic perennial and, um, and this butterfly only, it's, it's, uh, it's caterpillars when it's a larval, in its larval stage, it's caterpillars only eat the foliage of the lupin. And so this is a plant that's been, um, unfortunately, uh, really knocked back by, you know, development and disturbance of ours. Um, and so too has that population of butterflies. That population of butterflies has been seriously harmed because we've been really reducing the population of its one host plant. So especially with butterflies, lepidopterans and moths, they, um, when they're caterpillars, they have a choice. The plants don't want to be eaten, right? Plants, the last thing a plant wants to be uh, to happen, and he doesn't want us to eat it, doesn't want the pollinators to eat it. So it develops all of these chemicals, right? All the spices that we love, the mints, um, the heat, all of that stuff are plants' defense mechanisms so that they won't get eaten. And of course, we love the workaround and we find a million ways to like cook an onion and work with those spices and we love them. But they evolved specifically so that these plants will not get eaten. And some of them we still don't eat, right? That are like poisonous, like hemlock. Or like that's a defense mechanism that that plant has come up with specifically not to get eaten. And so when you're a caterpillar and your strategy is to just eat leaves, you have two choices. Again, with the, the same as with the pollinators. You can either specialize and spend thousands and thousands of years developing the resistance in order to tolerate certain chemicals in the foliage. And then your larvae can just eat those, those leaves 
and then you're really tied in to those plants and you become a specialist. Um, so things like monarchs, right? Like they can, they have to eat milkweed. And milkweed is mostly toxic to all of the other organisms. There's a few other organisms that have specifically evolved to metabolize the latex and the milkweed and even use it to then also become toxic themselves. Um, but it's, it, that is a very, very close specialization. Um, but you get to eat plants that nobody else can eat. So you have this abundant resource, but you're tied into it because it's a protected resource. Um, so the lupin and the carner blue butterfly are a perfect example of that sort of specialization. The good news with this plant and this butterfly is that through the Xerxes societies and others, um, they've been really encouraging people to plant lupin. And when you plant big populations of lupin, you can get the butterfly. Um, so that's something that, again, if you have a farm and, um, and available space, you should just plant. This is one of those plants that takes no resources whatsoever. Um, and uh, you can just scatter the seeds and chances, there's a, I don't, I've never done it. I'm doing it in Brooklyn, right? I'm trying to like get this rare butterfly in Brooklyn. Not yet. I'll let you know when I do. Um, but, uh, but out here, you have a much better shot of it. Um, it's something that could, could actually happen. Um, so that is in contrast to a butterfly like this, which is called a gray hair streak. Um, and this is a generalist. And this is a butterfly whose larvae can eat a wide variety of different plants. They can eat over 80 different plants. And most of those plants are in the pea family. Um, no, they're not. They're all different types. That's a sulfur. Um, but but the, the plants that the larvae of this butterfly can eat are not well chemically defended. Right? So it's making that trade-off where it could never eat a lupin, it could never eat a milkweed. It's eating things that we like that are kind of like sweet, that are, are not those chemically defended um, plants. And so this is a generalist, right? So these are these two strategies. And oftentimes in nature, um, when, uh, when ecosystems get disturbed or altered, um, the first thing to go are the specialists. Those are those really, really delicate relationships that take thousands of years. And then we're left with just a giant population of generalists, which again, like in New York City, that's, that's what we have. We do not have specialists in New York City because there is such constant disturbance and such rollovers of plants. Um, but often when you read these studies, uh, I, I use native plants almost exclusively. The park has exotics, um, but I really truly believe in the importance of native plants specifically because it's not just about getting bees or getting butterflies to, you, to, to your property, um, to the landscapes you're working on. It's about attempting to sustain these incredibly delicate dynamics that, that are, are in way more risk than something like this. These guys are gonna figure it out. They have the tools in their toolbox. You can't be, I can't be um, satisfied just seeing those organisms. And a lot of times when you see these arguments, especially out of the UK when they're trying to rationalize the use of exotic plants in landscapes or invasives even. A lot of their studies are based on things like um, pollinator abundance or bird abundance. They don't talk about which species they are. Often they're invasive. Um, so it's, it's really just critical to, to think about that dynamic between specialization and, um, and uh, generalization. Did you have a question? Yep. Absolutely. I think that um, uh, I don't, I f first, the first answer is that I don't have a lot of information. And, and what I've learned is strictly by listening to those people talk about it. Um, and they, they would be much better sources for you. And I can give you some recommendations for that. Uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer, I just saw her speak at the New York Botanic Garden. And she's incredible. Um, there's also a man who, um, who has an institute called the Delta Institute. And he's not indigenous, but he, um, studies very closely uh, the relationships, like um, the relationships that uh, people of this region have developed over thousands of years that are uh, mutualistic. So um, methods of um, harvesting plants that are not just wiping out the populations. Where, and there are certain plants that rely on that kind of uh, disturbance, um, where if you're harvesting one bulb, the bulblets will stay in the ground and then 
um, spread or if you're harvesting rice, the act of knocking it with the, with the rice knockers is distributing those seeds around as well. So there are, that information is out there and I can get you that. Arthur Haynes is that guy's name, H-A-I-N-S, um, and he's with the New England Wildflower Society. Um, and so there are people actively, and I think there's someone speaking, if not a bunch of people speaking at this conference about exactly that stuff as well. So there, that knowledge is like, is, is so much more difficult to accumulate and sustain than, than that sort of like Western knowledge, right? Because we can write it in a book. And when it comes to those sorts of relationships where you know how to sustainably harvest a plant, that kind of stuff takes thousands of years to develop and to pass along, and and that's and it's really specialized, right? And um, and and far more delicate and easy to destroy than than this this kind of knowledge, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, I am making really slow progress here. Um, that's what happens. Um, who recognizes this flower? A maple. Yes, absolutely. This is a maple flower. Um, so this is a flower that is on a maple tree, and it is wind-pollinated. Um, and uh, this is a, a tree in full bloom uh, in the spring. And you'll notice that these flowers are green. They are not showy in any capacity. They're very pared down. There's not big petals. And that's because they don't have anybody to impress. This is still a, a, a seed plant. This is still an angiosperm. But because it's not trying to attract a pollinator, it hasn't needed uh, to develop any of the showy uh, structures of, um, of those flowers that are animal pollinated. So no colors, um, the whole flower itself photosynthesizes, which is beneficial. Um, it's really just, uh, it's releasing its pollen to the wind. Um, so um, the pollen itself is very different than the pollen of a, of a animal pollinated plant. It's meant to fly. It's not meant to stick to the leg of an organism, right? So the pollen itself is a different shape. It's got different aerodynamic strategies. And then it, the tree itself blooms um, before the leaves come out uh, early, early in spring because um, once these leaves come out, you can, you can imagine that they're, it's much more difficult for that pollen to get to fly around. They're going to hit the leaves, right? And so a lot of these uh, wind pollinated plants are the first uh, plants to bloom early in spring, specifically because as that pollen is flying around, it has less stuff to get stuck onto and has a much better chance of, um, of hitting another flower of another plant. Go ahead. That pollen is getting spread by the wind to land on another maple tree that is a female. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and um, this kind of pollination um, is, um, is something that uh, works best in monocultures, right? So if you think about the kind of plants that are wind pollinated, grasses and pine trees, they're often in a, a forest grove or a field. And so they need a bunch of like individuals all in the same environment. Um, because again, you just get these these like literal orgies where there's like a ton of sperm just floating around at one time and everybody's receptive all at the same time and it's horrible for those of us with allergies um, and, um, and that's uh, how that happens. Grasses um, do the same thing. Does anyone recognize this grass? <laughs> um, often people forget that it's a grass, um, but of course this is corn. Um, and it's very altered from its original format where uh, before humans got to it. But you can see that this is a grass and this is wind pollinated. And here are the male flowers right here. And these are these anthers hanging down. Um, and then the female flowers are tucked in the sheaths. And you guys will all recognize uh, this little uh, proto corn here. Does this have a name? Assumed to be corn? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it's, it's, this is the female, right? And all of these silks, all of those silks on the flower hanging down, those are all the stigmas and the styles. Oh, those are the female parts of the flower. And so that pollen coming from those anthers at the top, that pollen swirls around and lands on the ends of each one of these silks. And then the pollen grain germinates and travels all the way down that silk, all the way into the kernel, and then fertilizes each one of those kernels individually. And have you ever, you know, the experiment that you can do with kids where you like make different colors of kernels? Have you ever done that? It's really fun. You can like take a blue corn and a yellow corn and pollinate um, the individual silks with the different, um, 
And then you can make like a, 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 an ear of corn that's like half blue and half yellow because each one of these kernels is getting pollinated individually with the pollen of, of, another, of another plant. And so if you imagine that, that the pollen tube has to grow all the way down that style, it's just this incredible journey that it has to go to to get, and this is actually um, the, the fastest growing pollen tube ever recorded is in corn because it has this incredible journey to grow through. And I actually, I forget what it was, but I calculated the speed one time and it was something, it was literally like five miles an hour that it was like cruising through to get down. It was an amazing, it was not five miles an hour. It was way, way less than that. But I'll figure it out for, for the future. I'll post it to the internet. Um, and then yes, and then and then this is another environment in which uh, wind pollination is is common, um, is in an, a, a place like a field, right, where all of the reproductive structures of the grasses they grow them on the top, above all the other plants, so that you can get this like cloud kind of hovering above everything, where all of the pollen is floating through the air and all the reproductive structures. And like I can. I can talk about this stuff for seven million years, and we'll just spend the whole time looking at grasses. But um, when you look at the, when you look really closely um, at the grass flower morphology, it's a really beautiful. And again, one of those things that people don't really see um, because they don't look really closely at stuff. But you can see here are the male anthers right here, and then these are the female um, stigmas, and they're like these combs that comb through the air, and they're just like looking for the pollen, right? They're just like combing through the air. And then, this is where it's like so beautiful, even the oscillation of the, of the stalks of grass themselves are in rhythms and vibrations that are specifically evolved in order to more effectively scoop that pollen out of the air. It's just this incredibly elegant, elegant stuff. Um, and then there's, let's see what the next one is. Um, you can also imagine when you think about wind pollination, there's a lot of fluid dynamics that go into all of those movements of those um, of the pollen and the and the plants themselves, um, because if you think about if you have like a, a stream and a rock in the middle of the stream and you put a leaf in that stream and that leaf is going down, it's not going to slam into that rock, right? That's not what actually happens. It kind of goes around the rock. And that's because the water flowing around that rock is what's called a boundary layer. There's like a, a space right close to the rock where the water's like not even moving. Um, and plants have that same thing. They have that boundary layer where very close to the, close to the plant, the air is like not even moving. Um, and out here, the air is moving way faster. Um, and so the plants are always trying to move their anthers outside of their own boundaries. Trees do this, grasses do this, any wind pollinated plant does this. They want to poke their anthers outside of that boundary layer so they can get picked up and carried on the wind. Um, and then they also want to move themselves in such a way that they're getting their stigmas outside. They're combing that, um, the air so that they can pick up, pick up um, the pollen in that process as well. So they have, if you look closely at the flowers, you can see all of this stuff. It's readily apparent once you look closely. Pine trees are another um, plant that does this. When these are, when the female cones are giving off, I'm sorry, the male cones are giving off pollen, if you tap them, they just explode with pollen. It's a really amazing, amazing thing. And again, when they release pollen, it's like insane. Um, all over the place. The last thing they want is to get it on your car. They're trying to create a real field, a real cloud of pollen in a forest that, um, that just swirls all around. And a lot of people give uh, wind pollination a bad rep. They think, oh, it's primitive. It's not as highly evolved as insect pollination. Um, but I think it's just the most incredibly elegant thing. And that doesn't mean that it's not um, amazing. And so these plants are not just like, casually sitting around waiting for pollen to land on them, right? Like they've developed incredible features like the, the movements and the structures and vibrations and, and then even turbulence, right? So a lot of these cones, and even some people think the shapes of the trees themselves are, have developed in such a way that they create little eddies so that if a pollen grain is flying by, it gets caught in a little spiral right around the cone and has a much higher increased chance of going in to the cone and finding um, the female parts and fertilizing the, um, the ovule. Um, so, so, and, and there's all these wonderful videos on the internet of these incredibly amazing nerds who just like put these cones in wind tunnels and will, will map the flow of air 
all around them. And so you can see that if a, if a, a pollen grain is flying by, um, more, they, the, the shape of the plant itself is not passive. It is very actively conducting the wind and conducting the, um, the pollen around it so that to place it exactly where they want it. And some people think that that's one of the origins of the cone shapes of pine trees as well, that they are not only conducting the pollen around the individual cone, but kind of swirling it around the entire tree themselves. That just blows my mind. Is that like amazing? I know, I just love it, love it. Um, so, um, so I'm sure all of you know this, but, um, but uh, I always have to include this in case you don't. Um, so uh, this, does anyone recognize this plant? Ragweed, the enemy. Um, this is a wind pollinated plant and it's a native plant. Uh, they're both native plants. Um, but this is a wind pollinated plant. You can tell that these flowers have no desire to, um, to attract anybody, right? They're green. Um, um, and uh, you don't even see this unless you're trying to eradicate it. It isn't a plant, it is, it is a plant that people who are not actively aware of plants don't even see it. However, this plant is goldenrod, and this is a showy plant trying to attract um, animals, and in doing so, attracts us, and it's very obvious to us as well. Um, and this uh, animal-mediated uh, pollen, bumblebees especially, um, is really big and sticky and is not going to uh, cause anyone any pain during allergy season because it's not going to fly into your nose. This one is, this is wind pollinated. But because these are happening at the same time and the vast majority of people don't see this plant because it's not trying to get our attention, goldenrod gets blamed for allergies all the time. It is amazing. Um, even when I was looking for images of ragweed in order to make this slide on Google, when I, you put in ragweed on Google, you get images of goldenrod. <laughs> it's crazy. And then like the weather channel when it's like fall allergies, they have goldenrod. It's just this ridiculous, ridiculous situation. And as a, it is, and as a native plant designer, when you try to plant goldenrod, everyone's like, no, 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 I have allergies. But the only way this, the only way that, and it's even questionable that this plant would ever give you a headache with allergies is by literally shoving it up your nose. And that is, it probably wouldn't even bother you at that point either. So you can see how the plants that bees like also, right? The plants that are trying to attract animals also attract us, um, that we see them uh, more than anything. And um, <clears throat> this is a plant that's really attractive um, and, is, um, and this is an animal pollinated plant. This is a, a, an iris, one of our native iris cristata um, and um, it is bee pollinated. And, um, and we're gonna talk about um, animal pollination now. Um, and yeah, I think that this is one of those things where, you know, this is a flower that's evolved with bees over thousands and thousands, if not millions of years. And thank you bees for giving us this because there's, there, everything about this flower is communicating with bees. Um, they are bright colors that register on the wavelengths of light that bees see. Um, this flower also has something called nectar guides right here that are um, the flower advertising pollen and, and nectar, but really it's mostly pollen. Nectar guides are usually yellow, um, and that flower is just saying, it's, it's literally a landing strip, right? It's, it is communicating how and where to get the nectar and the pollen from this flower. Um, so some, some flowers that will even fake it, they won't have nectar available, um, but they'll still have like yellow on their petals because they're trying to um, trick bees. Um, but there's a lot of, we only understand a small fraction of the information that this flower is, is communicating to bees. Um, and there's a lot of information about like how to approach the petal, how quickly, where to land, and then um, even the volume of resources available. Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll do that in a, in a minute as well, but I can do it now. It's fine. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry to the internet on my nose blowing mic. <sighs> but uh, nectar is, uh, people thought for a long time that nectar was just sugar water. Um, only certain flowers have nectar. A lot of early spring flowers don't make it. Um, and now people have realized that um, uh, sugar is just one tiny, tiny element of what, um, what nectar contains. It also contains things like amino acids, um, uh, poisons, um, yeasts, 
uh, that are all really, really complicated to the part to the point now where it's like this incredible little cordial that is baked and uh, and cooked and sustained. And plants will put things like nicotine and caffeine uh, to control the um, <clears throat> control the behavior of their pollinators to either attract them, up their memory, keep them away, uh, be exclusive. They they very very closely regulate. Um, what is in their nectar. And it is really like these potions um, that the plants are providing and um, for, their, for their pollinators and also nectar robbers, which we'll talk about as well. But um, I think that you know, well-meaning individuals, and I'm one of them who do things like put up hummingbird, um, hummingbird feeders, that is not a uh, replacement for the nectar that those birds need from flowers. Um, sugar water is like McDonald's compared to the real food that the plants are producing that also are medicine, right? There's like, there's nectar that is alcoholic that the, the pollinators can use to regulate viral loads and bacterial loads, right? So it's like this incredibly, again, just like complicated world that we really don't understand that well. Um, but, um, but that's what, um, that's what, uh, nectar in a nutshell. Um, and uh, and um, when you look at these um, these beautiful colors, um, you can uh, you can look at this and say, okay, that's bee pollinated because it's purple, violet, and yellow, and um, are often bee pollinated. But it doesn't mean anyone. Lots of other organisms are going to visit it. But um, bees see very differently. Birds see very differently than we do. And uh, we are humans. Here's our eye. And we have three cones in our eye. And each cone has a, a range of colors that they can see um, on the spectrum. And um, we can see not into the ultraviolet, although some people, theoretically, there are tetrachrome people. Is anyone here a tetrachrome? No, I really, sometimes I try and think that maybe I'm a tetrachrome, <laughs> but I don't think I am. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there's, there are some people reportedly who are tetrachrome and can see ultraviolet. Um, but most, the vast majority of humanity has three cones. We can't see ultraviolet. We can't really see very well into the red spectrum. Um, bees also have three cones, but that is shifted into the ultraviolet. So they can see a whole range of colors on flowers that we cannot see, um, but they can't see very well into the red, um, under the red side of the spectrum. Whereas birds have four cones, they also go well into ultraviolet and well into the red. Spectrum. So when we look at the bird pollinated syndrome, the vast majority of bird pollinated flowers are yellow and red. Um, and that's because the birds can see them, but also because the bees can't see them, which is just as if not more important than the birds being able to see them. It's what you're keeping away. So flowers are always trying to attract their partners. They're also always trying to keep other organisms away. It's this very delicate dance. I don't like to use words like warfare because it's too simplistic and that's anthropomorphizing. Um, but it is, it is a complicated relationship where even with their pollinated partners, pollinator partners, they're always trying to get the flowers in a, the perfect flower world. The flower wants a pollinator to uh, visit it once, take as little nectar and as little pollen as possible, or even take no nectar and no pollen, and then fly really far away and visit another flower of the same species. From the pollinator's perspective, the pollinator wants to land on one flower, eat as much as it wants, never go anywhere else, and fly away. So you have these, both organisms want to expend as little resources as possible um, to get as much from their partner as possible. And so oftentimes flowers um, will use things like nectar and toxins so that they, their pollinators are not hanging out too long, that encouraging them to fly farther away um, so that they don't, um, I'm getting ahead of myself anyways. Point being, these are the ranges of, of visible light that these various organisms can see. And this is how we would see a field of black-eyed Susans. And this is how a bee would see it, totally different. Like the yellows really glow as far as we know, right? Um, the yellows really glow, they pop in a way that um, they don't for us. Um, and then this is how a bird might see that. And there's these incredible, again, and in the bowels of the internet you can find um, these groups of individuals who just have all of these filters on their computer and they hang out 
um, with black lights in their bathroom and look at different flowers under black lights. I am one of these people. Um, and uh, it's amazing. It's amazing to see. And now there's even people who are looking at um, caterpillars under black lights. There's this amazing guy in New Jersey who literally just goes out with a black light at night and shines it on different caterpillars and posts them to Facebook. And there's this whole world where they're communicating to each other in ultraviolet that is like this, literally this guy from New Jersey is just discovering this amazing, amazing stuff. Um, and there's a lot of information that these flowers are communicating that we're not seeing because of our limited um, uh, eyesight. And so here's a, a typical primrose. This is how we see it. But when you look at it under ultraviolet light, um, you can see that this is, these, are, these nectar guides are communicating information that we can't see. They're saying where to land, how fast to land, approaching speeds. All of that stuff is getting communicated. Even the common dandelion has a bullseye. This is a really common ultraviolet um, pattern where you get this really clear bullseye of, uh, of where to land. Um, and there's really wonderful stuff with these ultraviolet halos now being projected. That it's just, it's very, very cool stuff. Um, and then this is an aster. Um, this is one of a bajillion asters that are maybe still blooming. Or any, are any of the asters still blooming yeah, outside? One goofy iris. I mean, one goofy aster that's uh, like a heart-shaped leaf heart. Uh huh. Aster. And it's, I don't know why it's blooming. But awesome. It won't quit. So you can go outside right now. <laughs> it's great. It's great. And you can see this. So if you notice the insides of these asters, these are those composites, right? They're made up of, of dozens in this, uh, in this case, little florets. And you can see that when they first bloom, they're bright yellow. You can think of that bright yellow color and ultraviolet is going to glow. And then after they're pollinated within a matter of hours, they turn maroon. So if you're a bee and you're flying through here, these unpollinated flowers are just completely popping. They're so bright. It's like um, a, a landing field, right? That's often the, the metaphor that people will use or the simile that people will use for, um, for this level for floral communication to pollinators is that they're like, they've got um, their, their uh, light landing strips, all of that stuff uh, very well communicated to the, to the pollinators and the, um, that brightness of the yellow and sometimes whites as well really registers as glowing. And then this maroon goes into the red uh, spectrum and the, it turns black under a black light. You can't see it at all. So if you're a bee and you're flying by, it's really easy. You can very efficiently land on flowers that have not been pollinated. Um, and it's beneficial for the plant as well because you're not wasting that bee's energy flying to flowers that have already been pollinated either. You're, it's a, a very good mutualism. And this is really wonderful. I love this because once you start looking for this, it cannot be unseen. Every time you look at an aster now, you will see the vast difference between pollinated and unpollinated flowers. Um, and so many other flowers do this too. Horse chestnuts, catalpas, even um, uh, things like lupin, the shift in colors is one of the ways that flowers communicate to their pollinators to say whether or not they've been pollinated. Um, and again, this is something that is not widely recorded or known, but you being out in the field, you can watch these dynamics and record them and post them to Instagram um, and, um, and see these kinds of things happening. It's really incredible. Um, pollen, this is pollen, a, a real close up on pollen. And um, you can see just the really different types of pollen. Um, there's uh, wind distributed pollen, animal distributed pollen is very different as I spoke about. It's bigger, it's stickier. Um, there's water distributed pollen, but all pollen is protein. Um, and um, that's across the board. Um, and, uh, and so it's a really yummy thing for animals to eat. It's protein and it's coated in a waxy coating that um, is very persistent in the environment. There's fossilized pollen. That's one of the ways that people look at the evolution of plants is by looking at these, these waxy coatings that have persisted through the fossil record. Um, it's, uh, it's sometimes, it, it hits animals in all different places when it is animal uh, conveyed. It can be stuck to the leg, to the thorax, to the head. Different flowers, even within the, um, the lily family, different lilies will hit, um, will hit uh, hummingbirds at different places of their body so that um, different hummingbirds uh, visit different species. They won't get different species stuck to the same region. So one species of lily will hit a, hit a hummingbird on its head, 
Um, and so consistently as that bird visits other lilies of that same species that'll be sexually uh, reproducing that uh, plant and then same with, the, with its abdomen. Um, so it's really, it's an amazing world. Um, and this is what um, female bees collect to feed their larvae. Um, this, is, this is why these relationships really um, develop. There's a lot of other things that, um, that pollinators are after, um, but pollen was really the, the first one. And then of course there's nectar, which I've already told you about, um, but nectar is also this, um, this main resource that flowers are providing. Um, they are, um, and, then, and then for animals like a butterfly that don't have chewing mouth parts, they just have sucking mouth parts and they can only ingest liquids, it's really critical. This is, this is what they eat um, is nectar and they need to be able to get more than just sugar from the nectar, right? Like they need those amino acids, they need minerals, which they can also get from other sources as well, but um, that's the only type of food that they're able to get from flowers is that nectar. Yes, and some flowers just produce nectar, and some flowers produce nothing. So it's um, it's again, it's one of those dynamics where it's just like the the whatever works. The flower is always trying to do the least amount of giveaway, and the animals are always trying to get as much as possible. But there's um, you know different the flowers. Again, we could do like a three-hour talk just on nectar, but um, the plants are often, the shape of the plant itself is often trying to keep the nectar from drying out. Try, a, a lot of spring flowers are bell-shaped, right? Because they're, they're protecting that nectar and the pollen from rain. Um, so a lot of flower morphology is based around not just offering these resources, but protecting them. Um, and making sure that they, are, uh, that they don't need to go through that expensive process of producing the nectar and um, and the pollen any more than is absolutely necessary. They don't want to do that. Um, and yeah, I think you know. I always want to. Oh, sorry, Laura, do you have a question? I, I'm sorry. So and then there's some plants that seem like they're just sort of anomalies, like uh, like mints. Yes, they have. Yeah. So some nectar is better than others, right? That. Um, Mints are known just to be just this incredible attractant for bees, especially. It's, it is crazy. Any mint you plant, um, it's, it is, they go wild for it. And I'm guessing, I don't know the answer to why that is, but I'm guessing that there's some compound that the mint is producing that is attractive or medicinal or something for the bees. They're getting something out of the fact that that mint is chemically complicated. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think that that's another way that um, native plants are really critical, right? So, like, you can have something like Budlia, the butterfly bush, um, that can be also really popular among butterflies, but it might not be providing those butterflies with all of the other compounds and um, nutrients that they are used to getting from nectar. Also, it's not a host plant for any butterflies. So there's something to be said for those butterflies nectaring and then laying their eggs on, on plants that are, if not identical, close to each other. Um, does that make sense? Nectaring, right? Nectaring is a different thing. You're eating the, the, the nectar of one thing. Um, but you're laying your eggs as a, as, a, as a butterfly. You're laying your eggs on the leaves of a plant that your caterpillars need to be able to eat. Um, so those are two separate things. You can have butterflies will visit a wide variety of flowers, but they usually have to lay their eggs on just a narrow, um, a narrow swath of, uh, of plants as well. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there was something else I wanted to say about about the mints. Oh yes, there's things like rattlesnake master, um, the Aringian eucophilium, that is an awesome, cool, beautiful plant. Um, it's a perennial plant that's native to this region. And that is the same thing as a mint, but for things like wasps and beetles. And you just get this incredible diversity of, and I don't know if it's the pollen or the nectar. I don't know enough about the plant to know what's actually going on. And that's something that you could literally, if you were interested, like get your hand lens out and watch those beetles and tell me, please, like tell me what's actually going on there. But um, 
but that is something that is, is just incredibly attractive for whatever reason what that flower is giving off is, is incredibly attractive to a totally different range of animal than the mints are. Um, and uh, it's just a super, I always make sure that it's included in, in every planting I do. I, I noticed this year that the St. John's wort that we have, the bees go in a frenzy. Uh -huh. Lots of different kinds, around and around and around. Yep. And it blooms long. Uh -huh. But I couldn't really see what it was they were taking. It looked like there was, it was pollen they were moving around. Those yep. Flowers, but they were so animated by that plant. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't know enough about, and that's something you could like, like tell us, right? Like just, to, just go watch. But you can see, you can see what they're doing. My guess, when I've seen bees like circling and stuff like that, what they're doing is fighting over territory. Um, that it's most often it's the male bees that recognize that this is a valuable resource that the females are going to visit, and so they fight with each other over. And that's what they do on my rudbeckia at my house. And so you just see these like little orbits that they're they're constantly doing and you see that level of activity but I don't know again the answer to that. Um, <clears throat> moth pollination uh, is very similar to butterfly pollination but it happens mostly at night um, and uh, and they are also they have a proboscis um, so they also need to just drink the nectar um, and they're, um, they're uh, have this wonderful sense uh, because they don't want to visit a flower, they, they're not able to get the same cues as a flower. The flower is not able to give off the same cues as a flower during the day is able to give off, right? They're not able to give off things, vi visual cues as easily as a, as a daylight flower. Um, so nighttime pollinated flowers are often bright colors. They're white and light purple and sometimes light yellow as well. Um, and they often have a very strong and far carrying scent. So they are trying to communicate um, uh, through different faculties than daytime uh, pollinated flowers are. And so you get a lot of things like nicotine, right? That you, it has a very strong scent, or even some of the primroses, where um, they smell strongly. They bloom and start smelling strongly at night uh, or in the evening time when these moths, this is a hawk moth, are, are out and about. One of the cool things that people have recently uh, discovered about these dynamics as well is that the moths do not want to visit a flower that's been recently visited. To like go through the effort of hovering in front of the flower, unfurling your proboscis, drinking that nectar, and then and finding there to be nothing is a, a huge waste of resources for this animal. So they're actually sensitive enough, sensitive enough to test the humidity bubble around this flower. And so if there's nectar there, and the nectar is creating literally a humidity bubble, the the moth can sense that and will only visit um, flowers that have not been visited yet, that have the volume of nectar to affect the humidity outside of those flowers. So I just feel like that stuff is so gorgeous. You can imagine what that, what that would smell like if you were a moth to be in this like perfumed nicotine spa <laughs> where it's like incredible, incredible stuff. Um, and then other flowers are giving off heat, right? We talked about this as well. Um, this amorphophallus, the tip here gets as hot as a human. Um, and that heat, uh, again, it's mimicking rotting flesh. It mimics the heat that those uh, breaking down um, th uh, uh, meats are giving off, but it also dissipates the stench of rotting meat. Um, and the flies can smell that and are attracted to that, and that smell gets out farther um, due to the heat that that's giving off as well. So, and that's something that um, <clears throat> that they're really uh, that's an offering, right? That the plant is giving up is that heat. I, we talked about that being a habitat, and it's really really critical in the colder temperatures in which a lot of these flies are pollinating. And this is the coolest one. Um, and this is really just over the last five years that this has been um, discovered and people are doing such cool research with this. And this is a mapping of the electromagnetic field around a flower. Um, and this is not hippie stuff. This is science. Um, this is not the aura. It is actually the uh, electromagnetic field. And if you think about a flower, um, a flower is a, uh, a plant, is a, um, a tube, has a tube of water that goes down into the earth and it has a negative charge. Like when you uh, ground your stereo, what you're doing with that copper wire is sticking it into the earth to take advantage of the negative charge of the earth, right? Um, and flowers do just that because they have that 
aquatic tube grounding them down into the earth. And so they have this negative charge. And bees are fuzzy little guys. They're covered, gals really mostly, they're covered in static electricity and they pick up additional positive um, static electricity as they fly through the air and they're all fuzzy like your, you know, your hair sticking up. So you have this positively charged bee um, and then this negatively charged flower. Um, and when the bees, they've had, there's videos of bees that as they're flying over a flower, the pollen jumps from the flower to the bee. They don't even need to land because of that electromagnetic uh, uh, relationship between the two. Also, um, the bees are able to, um, again, they, they can sense these electromagnetic fields in ways that we just are not able to at all. And so when bees land on the flower, when they're a positively charged force landing on this negatively charged force, they're affecting the, the field charge of that flower. And they can also read that. So that's one way that bumblebees especially are able to figure out whether or not a flower has been recently visited. They can sense the electromagnetic field of that flower and think about whether or not they want to land on it and whether or not it's worth their energy. Um, one thing um, that I didn't have a slide for, but um, I wanted to include also that bumblebees are, are, are able to do is um, they leave a scent uh, trails with their feet. They sort of leave their scent on flowers as well that other bumblebees are also able to pick up um, because it's all in everybody's best interest, right? Nobody's trying to, well, lots of trickery is happening, but in general, um, there's not, uh, a lot of these organisms are trying to make the process easier for especially their sisters and their hive um, so that they can tell whether or not another organism has visited. Um, there's also oils that a lot of flowers, not a lot, but many flowers will give off that um, bees, uh, bees and wasps especially will gather oils from flowers, like orchids especially, um, and they use the, those oils to be more attractive to females. So the male bees will often gather oils and be more attractive to, to their females. And that's, that's the thing, yeah, it's the you know, same, same things going on. Um, but, uh, and that's the thing that the flower is giving off. Um, and, uh, and sometimes, again, like, just to impress upon you the extent to which the stuff isn't known, my favorite flower in the entire world is Magnolia grandiflora, the giant southern magnolia, and it's like this big. Um, and the, um, as the, uh, as the, um, the flower gets pollinated, those anthers and, um, will, uh, fall in the cups that the, those giant petals create. And I've witnessed firsthand so many bumblebees will literally go bathe in those anthers. And they buzz, they do, we'll talk about buzz pollination, they do this buzz pollination thing where they're obviously not collecting pollen, they're obviously not um, eating it, they're doing this thing where they like revel in these anthers and throw them around and like bathe in them in these cups of petals. And all I can figure is that they are collecting this oil um, that the flower is giving off for some reason. It could be medicinal, it could be, who knows what it is, but there's, again, a lot of this behavior and processes. Um, I personally don't know what it is. If there's anyone, if you could figure it out again, let me know. If the internet figures it out, <laughs> let me know. Um, and now we're going to get into pollinators. Um, before we get into pollinators, we're just going to run through the, like, the big groups of pollinators. Does anyone have any questions about this stuff that I just, just covered? I know it's a lot. Yeah. Absolutely. And when we, we'll talk um, more, more specifically about nicotine pollination and a really clear example of that for the internet that can't hear you, I'm just going to repeat what you said, which is that, um, that um, the pollination, uh, like things like nectar, are often used as uh, methods of communicating injury and, um, and, and to other insects as well, like especially damaged leaves. There's a lot of research showing that as when leaves get damaged, that plants start sending out signals of, I'm damaged. Um, they can even attract the 
a, a leaf is able to like tell which caterpillar is eating it and send out a signal to attract the parasitic wasp to go after that caterpillar specifically, right? Like all of this stuff is is becoming that science is finding it and it's becoming popular and and it's I think a very hopefully humbling experience for everyone that we realize that there's these levels of communication going on that we have um, many of us not all of us haven't haven't really been tapped into for for a long time. All right, anything else before we jump into the pollinators? Yeah. Absolutely. So that is again that's something that we'll get into more in detail as we go through, but you're absolutely right. That is that is something that happens. And um, especially when you take a flower that has abundant resources um, of anthers and you change them all into petals, like a wild rose versus an ornamental rose, you're drastically altering, and it doesn't even need to be GMO, it can just be through the process of cultivation. You're drastically altering that flower. When you change the colors, you're changing those communications. Um, you, are, you are very seriously um, uh, breaking apart the natural systems that have evolved. That said, it's not all negative, and there's a lot of really interesting research coming out of Mount Cuba with ornamental flowers um, where they're looking at cultivars. So if you take something like a coreopsis, like a tick seed, there's a lot of different cultivars of coreopsis, um, or even something like phlox, or I just saw a, a speech on Monarda, um, and they look at all of the various cultivars of a Monarda or a phlox that they have, um, they've created for different colors, for mildew resistance, all of these different, for ornamental long blooming, drought tolerance, all of these things that human want, humans want out of their flowers um, and, and are not in any way related to what animals need out of those flowers. But the interesting research is that they're actually looking at the sugar content of the nectar, the amino acid content of the nectar of these specific cultivars, and then also tracked, uh, tracking pollinator visitation on those cultivars. And they found that there, it's not uh, uncommon that for certain cultivars of plants to be far more attractive and have more nectar and more pollen than the straight species of certain plants as well, or longer blooming periods. So you can read that in two ways. You can say, okay, that's better. We're making these things better for these animals and, and it's not all bad. Um, you can also say that there's probably reasons why those plants evolved those limited nectar stores or, uh, or flower sizes. Um, and, and there's a, a delicate balance there that um, is being uh, born out of thousands and thousands of years. And so, just because something's happening more doesn't necessarily mean it's happening better or more sustainably or healthier. So um, wherever possible in my work, I use native plants that are local ecotypes. And, um, and I, I'm so happy to see at the Young Farmers Conference that there's a lot of ecology stuff here. And there's a lot of people talking about the importance of that of that sort of work. Um, and it seems like word is getting out about the necessity of, of using straight species and, and things that humans have altered uh, less and less. Um, okay, <clears throat> so beetles are our first pollinators. Um, uh, again, and they were the first pollinators. Um, there's, a there's a lot of different beetles in the world. Um, there's tons and tons. There's 30,000 species of beetle in North America alone. Um, and uh, they evolved a solid 50 million years before bees did. So they were around a long time without bees. Um, and, uh, and they are responsible for pollinating the majority of plants on the planet. So we really see, we see bees a lot. We think of them as the pollinators, but, but because beetles are so primitive, um, they, they're very, very important pollinators. Um, the flowers that bees, that, I'm um, sorry, the flowers that uh, beetles pollinate are, um, are often robust, right? They have thick petals to deal with the weight of a beetle. Um, they are fleshy. Um, they're often uh, pink and white. 
Um, and um, the smell is a little bit musky and lemony. If you know a magnolia, if you've smelled a magnolia, there are some magnolias like Magnolia virginiana, um, the sweet bay magnolia, that's like a wonderful smell from five feet away. And then when you get your, put your nose in it, it's a little bit musky. And that's kind of what the beetles are after. Um, I like be beetle pollinated flowers from just a little bit far away. Um, and things like water lily, spice bush, um, those are beetle pollinated. Um, uh, magnolias also, they don't, a lot of these flowers that are beetle pollinated don't really produce nectar, they produce pollen because that's what the, um, the beetles are after. Um, and, um, the, and they do what I spoke about, the, the mess and soil pollination strategy where they're not trying to pollinate anything, they're just, they're eating the pollen, they're eating the leaves, they're eating the flower, they're just like, they're making a mess. Um, and by accident, they're also pollinating that flower. So a lot of these flowers are like, trying to contain the chaos of a beetle. They're like a, a cup or a vase where they're really, um, they're trying to keep this crazy activity to a minimum and keep it uh, organized around the reproductive stru structures of the flower. So this is the Vic Queen Victoria water lily. This is that water lily, this is giant, giant uh, petals that you've seen like babies sitting on on the internet. Um, this is a flower that um, uh, Ken Druce, a friend of mine, told me the uh, story of long, long ago that, um, that when someone, people have been cultivating this flower for hundreds of years, especially in the UK, uh, they have a, a much more robust horticultural tradition than in the United States does, and, um, and they could never figure out how to pollinate it, and then when this one horticulturalist figured out how to pollinate this, this lily, he was then knighted by the queen. And <laughs> Ken uses this uh, story to talk about how far horticulture has fallen. And uh, in the world, that like nobody cares anymore. No one would get knighted for figuring this stuff out any longer. But it's a wonderful story. It's an incredible story. So this is a bee pollinate, or I'm sorry, a, a beetle pollinated flower, um, and uh, and the flower is white. Um, and what happens is that it opens and it's white, and then a beetle lands on it and goes into the flower and starts doing its thing and being crazy, and the flower closes in and traps that beetle and it traps that beetle overnight. Um, and the beetle is freaked out and still eating and doing its thing and in the process is pollinating this flower crazily. Um, and then in the morning, the flower opens up again and is pink. So the flower just completely changes color um, and, when, and, and then it's signaling to the pollinators that, um, that it's been pollinated and, and don't come visit it any longer. And then once it's a after it's pollinated, it closes up entirely and sinks down into the water. The, um, the, the stem that the flower is on contracts and it goes down into the water where the seeds germinate uh, or, or uh, develop. And then as it's mature, it comes back up and opens up and you get that beautiful lotus uh, fruit. Um, and, uh, and then those are, those are distributed. But it really is a, a knighting worthy uh, story to, uh, to figure out. Um, <clears throat> Uh, this is, uh, does anyone recognize this flower? Sambucus, um, elderberry, uh, and great, great uh, plant um, for horticulture, agriculture. And this is a, a flower that technically, according to the books, is uh, beetle pollinated, but it's really, when I look at it, I think it's more, it looks more like a fly pollinated flower. And so what I'm describing, just to step back a little bit, uh, what I'm describing are called syndromes. These are pollination syndromes. And that means that certain plants have really clear methods of signaling to certain groups of animals. And so there's like a really clear, there's a few clear fly pollinated syndromes or bee pollinated syndromes. Um, that said, when you, you can learn all of this and you can look at a flower and say, that's probably gonna be butterfly pollinated. When you go outside and you look at these flowers, you can sometimes find every single type of pollinator on the same flower. That these are animals that are going to take advantage of resources where they can find them. They do not care about your syndromes. They do not care about even pollination, right? Like they're not actively trying to pollinate. You can have a flower that's being visited by 15 different pollinators just, but they're not actively pollinating it. There's only certain groups of animals that are able to move the pollen to the stigma, and we'll talk about that more with mints in the future. But when I look at this, even though this is listed, and a lot of the science is wrong. So a lot of the, of, you know, um, when you read about uh, the pollination ecology of a certain plant, 
sometimes those researchers are, again, just looking at who's visiting those plants, looking at, who, and that's not necessarily the animal that's pollinating them. Um, so this is a Sambucus. It's open, it's white, and fits the bill for a lot of fly-pollinated um, fly um, syndrome uh, elements. And th that's the next group of organisms that we're going to talk about are flies. So they get a bad rep. Flies are not, nobody thinks flies are super romantic, although they're super cool, and I will tell you why. Um, they are omnivores. They will eat pollen, they will eat meat, they will eat just about anything. Um, but the important thing about, to think about with flies is that they don't provision their young like other groups of animals. They lay their egg on the food source and then fly away. They lay their egg on the fruit source and fly away. Whereas if you think about bees, bees have a central nest that they're always coming back to. They have a very specific range that they need to have their food within range of where they live. And that shifts from bee to bee. And you have a list in your handout that shows you the distribution for large groups of bees of how far away. So if you're gardening or farming for these groups of bees, you need to know that you're creating this, this habitat that is within a certain number of feet from the floral resources that you're providing. Flies are very different. You don't need to do that. They will just fly all over the place. They have no home. They um, just go everywhere. Um, they're also, uh, they really like white flowers that are open, that are short, throated. Um, they don't have long tongues. We talked about the rotting meat. We'll talk about that as well. Um, they don't carry pollen. They only really drink nectar. Um, and uh, some of them are bee mimics. Uh, like this flower fly or hover fly. Um, a lot of them are bee mimics. And, um, and this is on a witch hazel, which is blooming very, very late in the fall. They're maybe blooming now. Yeah. Yep, awesome. Um, and we have them blooming now still uh, in Brooklyn. Um, and bees are really fantastic because they are the pollinator that is able to withstand the cold more than any other pollinator. So they often have dark bodies, they are covered in hair sometimes, um, and they're able to fly in weather that bees just won't come out in. So a lot of winter pollinated plants, a lot of early spring pollinated plants are bee, bee pollinated. The witch hazel is really incredible. It has these strappy flowers where um, on a, they open up on a cold, on a warm day, and then if it gets below freezing, they kind of curl up like, um, like a, a long carpet, right? They'll like roll the petals back up and be really cold, and then on a warm day, they'll open right back up again, um, and then they're they're communicating to these flies um, to come visit. You can see some of the bee mimics are really really good. Um, there's a fly called a bee fly. That's one of my favorite. It's super cute, but you can tell they're flies. You just there's a lot of different things, like the number of wings, but who's going to count the number of wings? That's crazy. Eventually, you just get to know their faces, and that's how you can differentiate this is just a, beef, or a, a fly face. And also, the flight pattern is really like angular as opposed to bees, or like more swoopy. Um, but, um, and they also, hoverflies will, um, they will hover, right? So these guys, if you're eating, they'll come and like, like look at you, right? And I used to be very flattered that they thought my face was a flower. But what they're actually doing is checking your face for aphids. And if they find <laughs> aphids on your face, um, they will lay their eggs there. Um, and, uh, and their larvae, flower fly larvae, are voracious aphid predators. They are some of the beneficial insects um, some of the most beneficial insects for aphid. Uh, aphid. So it's, it behooves you as a grower of things um, to make sure that you have f attractive to fly uh, flowers so that you can get these populations of, um, of these organisms. And from my perspective, I understand in agriculture it's very different. Um, in horticulture, we are always trying to build up these biological populations rather than purchase them and throw them at our, our uh, landscapes. It's a much more uh, sustainable and healthy uh, method of going about this stuff. You're not usually distributing diseases in the same way that when you buy things like ladybugs and lace wings, you can, you can also be moving diseases all around. Um, and so um, that's one of those differences between organic and ecological gardening. Um, <clears throat> but these guys, they're wonderful. They're really, really important. And you, when you see them on your plants, you can watch them. They're like, they're like, they're clear, and so you can see the aphids like getting eaten, um, and like even sometimes squirming around inside of them. Um, they're not flies are not super critical for agriculture, um, the way that bumblebees are, for example. This is a carrot. 
um, uh, Dacus carotta. This is a fly pollinated plant, but unless you're growing carrots for seed, which is anyone growing carrots for seed? Probably not. Probably. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I will just continue on forever, but after we do flies, we'll take a break. We'll take a break. Um, so yeah, um, you're really growing carrots for the root, um, so you probably don't care that they're fly pollinated, but it is a, a very commonly fly pollinated syndrome. Wasps will also visit, visit as well. Um, but they'll visit anything. Again, like this is a milkweed flower, right? And this is a green bottle fly. Um, and they will, they will happily visit to, um, to drink the nectar of just about any flower. Um, we talked about skunk cabbage and how important these are in the early, early spring, how they're generating all of the things that the flies like, like heat and rut and smells and purple and white flowers. Um, and then who recognizes this flower? Close. It does look just like the ginger flower. Anyone? Papa! Kapow! Um, so this is another flower that is fly pollinated and you can tell by the, the musky smell and the fact that it's dark purple and it's really, it's mimicking meat. Um, and this is the fruit. Uh, let's see what the next one is. Okay. Um, and so uh, this is something that pawpaws are notoriously difficult to pollinate and that a lot of people resort to hand pollination with pawpaws as well. Um, and some of that's because it is dioecious and there's um, males and females and you need to make sure that you have both males and females. But also you might not necessarily have the fly um, there. And so there's this myth, someone recently told me it wasn't actually true, but that this guy who, um, who has an orchard of pawpaws will hang fetid steak from his trees in order to attract and drag the fly pollinators. I'm not sure if that's, I like to believe it's true. Um, but I think one of my theories with papa is that the fruit, has everyone eaten papa fruit? It's wonderful, of good ones, it's very variable, right? There's a lot of good, a lot of bad. But one of the reasons why it's never really become successful in commercial production is because it bruises easily, it rots very quickly, it's hard to get it from the tree to the grocery store in good condition. Um, and one of my theories is that this is also a food source for the flies, that those quickly rotting fruits are laying on the ground and rotting and stinking it up, and that that's also, this is the tree's way of creating a food source over time for those organisms. And if anyone's growing papas, I'd love confirmation on that. I am not currently growing them, but it would be really interesting to see which flies are visiting the rotting fruits on the ground if those are, um, those are the same flies that are pollinating the plant. Um, <clears throat> Here's this little midge fly that is one of the most important pollinators on the entire plant, and on the entire planet. Does anyone recognize this flower? Yes. This is where chocolate comes from. And you do not get chocolate without this guy. Um, and so that, I think, you know, again, people have this, like, not really positive idea of flies and fly pollination where, you know, these incredible flowers, you can see all of the syndrome signs. They're, they're purple, they're musky, they're white. Um, and this little fly is, is literally the reason why we get chocolate. And I wonder if, I'd have never, I've only seen chocolate fruit once, but it is kind of similar to that pawpaw fruit, right? And I wonder if there's a similarity there as well, where there's like a rotting, uh, like the fruit is also providing this resource which I made up, right? Like, I don't know if that's true. I'm just thinking. So I, I, just to be really clear about that. And then next, we'll take a break. And then after the break, we'll get into butterflies. I have 45 minutes left to this. And I'm on page five <laughs> of 18. <Whoa>. So <laughs> it gives you a good sense of what happens every time. I, if you can imagine me trying to do this in 45 minutes, it's like a total joke. Um, but now is the choose your own adventure portion of the, of the talk. So I think it's important that I go through the rest of the pollinators and you learn about the pollination syndromes for, for bees and butterflies and birds. Um, I will take the time to do that. Um, and then there's uh, two big sections after that. Uh, one is the pollination syndrome of common farm plants, common agricultural plants, and we can talk about like and again, this isn't my, 
realm of expertise, like tomatoes versus apples, all that stuff, but I do know it from research. Um, and I can, I can show you that information. I can also just give you the resources to find that information on your own, which is art in your handout. Um, and then also there's a whole section that is on the practices that you can do um, in order to encourage pollinators in your landscape. Um, so I can kick it up a notch as far as speed and, um, and try and get through everything in a more superficial manner, which is very difficult for me to do, but I can, I can do it. Or we can kind of pick one of those uh, topics and I can go slowly through. I will have to go faster regardless, um, but I can go more slowly if you wanted to just uh, not do one of them. So um, raise your hand if you want me to just cover everything and just go really super fast. No one, or one person. Okay, one person, good, good feedback. Uh, raise your hand if you want me to focus on farm plants. Okay, directly relevant information. Raise your hand if you want me to focus on practices that you can do in your garden. Okay, so incrementally more people. So I think that I'm gonna try and cover everything. And, and what I'll do is <laughs> I will burn through um, the, uh, the uh, plant stuff and I'll kick it up a notch as well. And then also know that on your handout, you have so many resources um, as far as there's this one website, pollinators.ca, um, that is literally just every single crop and all of the research that everyone in Canada has figured out about how to pollinate those crops. Um, and that the vast majority of my information comes from that website. Um, so you can do your own, and it's very accessible and um, well designed um, as well. And then I'll just, I'll just cruise through this. So butterflies are so beautiful and wonderful. Everybody loves butterflies. They're like the gateway insect. Um, and uh, they, they are. They switch mouth parts over time. Click. Is this? Uh, oops. All right. They switch mouth parts over time. So when they're a caterpillar, their larval stage, they have chewing mouth parts. And then when they metamorphosize into their adult phase, their sexual reproduction phase, they have a sucking mouth part. Some lepidopter and some moths don't even eat in their sexual reproduction phase. They are just trying to have sex and they don't even eat, whereas caterpillars are eating machines. That's all they're doing there, the hungry, hungry caterpillars. And I think, you know, um, one of the things I always try and impress upon people is that everybody loves butterflies, but you don't get butterflies without the caterpillars and you don't get the caterpillars without the host plants. And so there's a lot of ornamental gardening that happens these days, which is awesome, that is literally just in, like including ornamental host plants for these butterflies in, um, in garden design. This is a black swallowtail caterpillar. Um, it starts off as a bird poop mimic. Um, and then as it builds up the uh, toxins that it's getting from um, the carrot family plants upon which it eats, um, it becomes what's called aposmatic and gets bright colors. And then rather than being camouflaged, it's communicating and saying, don't eat me, I'm toxic, um, which works most of the time. Um, and then this, these are, this is this wonderful uh, lady on Facebook who I follow who's just like, it's, it's, there's a lot of really crazy insect people on the internet. Um, and she did this incredible study where she, not study, post on a paper towel, obviously, where she's looking at the chrysalises of these um, black swallowtail butterflies. And it's apparent that the caterpillars are able to tailor the color of their chrysalis specifically to the substrate that they're creating. Um, their chrysalis on, which is just an incredible, if you think about the process by which that caterpillar is doing that, right? It's looking, it's like using different colors. It's just an incredible, incredible ability that we're really just learning again about what these animals are capable of. This is a, a, a spotted purple butterfly and this is its bird poop mimic phase as well. A lot of caterpillars do that because birds are their main predator. What do birds not want to eat? Their own poop. And so that's what the caterpillars are pretending. Uh, this is a question mark butterfly. These are just some of the great butterflies of our region. Uh, this is a uh, morning cloak, one of my favorites. This, this butterfly actually overwinters around here uh, in the duff layer in your garage. Um, and they're one of the earliest butterflies out in spring. Um, they love things like this ornamental nine bark. This is a native plant. Butterflies just go crazy for it. This is that hair streak that we looked at earlier. They are an abundant butterfly that you can see readily. They have a fake head on their tail. And some hair streaks, when they land on a flower, they actually waggle these little fake antennae to try and convince a bird or a spider to eat its tail rather than its head. 
um, and you can see that happening. These yellow butterflies are sulfurs. Uh, there's a wide variety of them that live around here, and they, um, they uh, eat uh, members of the pea family. Um, this is an American lady. Uh, there are a group of butterflies called uh, Vanessa butterflies, which the red admirals are also part of. Um, they have these red stripes, admiral stripes, on their wings. Um, they migrate through. Um, this is a, a tiger swallowtail, one of our larger butter, butterflies, and the swallowtails, when they haven't been bitten off, um, have these, these uh, little uh, tails, uh, which makes them swallowtails. There's a, a few of them. And then, of course, the monarch butterfly, our iconic American butterfly that is um, deeply endangered right now. This is the, the chrysalis. It's called a monarch from these gold dots on the chrysalis, and um, their populations are in big trouble. There's uh, some cause for hope this year that they're getting a little bit better, that the populations are rebounding. We saw way more of them in my park um, than we did in previous years. Um, but then new information came out. There's two big populations. There's the East Coast migration. There's the West Coast migration that goes up California. The West Coast migration, now those numbers are down 95%. There's a real serious threat that that migration is going to go extinct. There's also a real serious threat that the, the Eastern migration will also go extinct. Um, the, I'm, I'm actually not super hopeful about that. Um, does everyone understand that the monarch migration? I can, this is something I can, okay, so I'll do it really quickly. So monarchs that we see up around here, <clears throat> uh, they usually arrive in the summer and they hang out until around October. Um, and uh, in October, they, uh, they, and they live for a couple of weeks um, and they are eating the monarch, eating the, eating the milkweed and uh, nectaring on a wide variety of, of um, flowers. And then they create one special butterfly in the fall. And that one individual uh, goes into a sort of suspended, uh, not animation, but um, they live for much longer than the normal butterflies. And that individual in, uh, in October flies all the way down the entire country, all the way to Mexico for their overwintering grounds, uh, where they live there over the in the winter in these conifer forests that are filled with butterflies. So, so many butterflies that the, the branches break from the weight of the butterflies. Um, and again, that's in, uh, under severe threat of deforestation. Um, and then they overwinter there and they start their migration, the same butterfly starts that migration back up the country, gets to about Texas and dies. Um, and then before they've died, they've laid their eggs. And then that butterfly that hatches out of those eggs flies a little way for two weeks, lays those eggs, dies. And then you get this leapfrogging of generations back up to their summer habitat all throughout this region. They hang out for the summer for living for about two weeks. And then they create this other, this other um, generation that um, does this incredible journey um, throughout. So what happens, unfortunately, right, what's happening right now, the main reason that these butterflies are under threat, you can see they're like raggedy animals at the end of their season. And they, this is one of the many wonderful milkweeds that they eat. Um, one of the, and this is other, other animals also uh, eat the milkweed. We're going to skip that. Uh, is um, so much that I want to tell you about. But um, the, um, the main reason why these butterflies are in trouble is because of corn and soy production in the United States and Roundup, really. Um, the weeds, the milkweed that the butterflies uh, need in order to survive is not, uh, has, has been selected out by Roundup Ready Crops. And so the, when they get to Texas, when they get to the bread basket of the United States and there's no uh, resources there for them, um, they die. And they can't continue those generations up, uh, up in their migration. And so it's really critical for us to be planting milkweed as, as much as hum humanly possible. But it's far more critical for people in the Midwest to be growing organic food. And that's something that is recognized by the government. Although, again, like I'm not super optimistic that you're going to steer that ship in a way that's going to save this population, which doesn't mean we're going to lose the monarch. We might, but we'll probably lose that migration, unfortunately. You had a question? Do monarchs eat both like the wild milkweed and cultivated milkweed? Sure. So uh, yes, they do eat wild milkweed and cultivated milkweed. And there's some problems with especially the West Coast migration. There's an annual milkweed that's a tropical milkweed that um, blooms for a really long time. Our milkweeds, when they bloom, our native milkweeds, we have quite a few of them. 
um, they bloom really with the monarch uh, population's journey up the country. Like one milkweed or a few milkweeds are blooming for the monarch's arrival, although they do nectar on a wide variety of different plants as you've probably seen. Um, but um, over on the West Coast, when people plant this tropical milkweed, um, it blooms for a really long time and it's extra attractive to the monarchs. And so the monarchs actually get confused and stay and don't go to their overwintering grounds. And that's one of the reasons why that population is threatened. So again, this is one of those things where more is not necessarily better. You see a lot of butterflies on your flower, like that's not necessarily a good thing for that butterfly. You could be messing with its, with its natural cycles. So thank you for bringing that up. That is a really important thing to like, work with the plants of your region. Um, and not even the species of your region, but if it's possible to get seed sources from your local region, it's incredibly critical to do that, or even your property, right? Like I'm sure you can wild collect seeds from the Stone Barns property that have evolved here with these butterflies, um, rather than sourcing something from Home Depot, which could be from the Midwest. Um, this is a caterpillar eating the eating the foliage of the milkweed. So much cool stuff that I'm gonna blow through, but they have these cool little um, pollen packets. Their, their uh, pollination morphology is really neat. And there's a bunch of different animals that also, also eat, um, eat the milkweed. This is an aphid This is the, that I'm sure you've seen. This is an orange oleander aphid. It's actually invasive. It came in on oleander. Um, so normally I try to encourage people to make peace with their aphids as much as possible, but this guy, Destroy, um, it is actually impacting the wild populations of milkweed now. It's gotten out of, out of cultivation, and when you go hiking and you see swamp milkweed, especially the pink one, you can find these oleander aphids that are diminishing the, the plant in a very serious way. We'll talk about how to destroy them later. <laughs> I have a love-hate relationship with aphids. <laughs> Uh, Luna moths, are, I mentioned, these guys don't eat uh, when they're adults. Uh, they're just there for sex. Um, and then this is this marvelous orchid that, um, that was found by, by Darwin and has a, a nectar tube that is um, like, I think the number is 13 inches long. And Darwin saw this and hypothesized that there must be a moth with a proboscis that was just as long in order to get down to the, bases of that, the base of that tube and get the nectar. And everyone laughed at Darwin. And then after he died, of course, they found this, this, uh, this hawk moth that I think is called like Darwin's moth or something with this incredibly long proboscis. So you can see there's like, it's like an arms race where each organism, it's beneficial for each organism to um, uh, withhold the resources a little bit or make them difficult to access. And then this other organism is chasing it and you get these like ridiculous extremes sometimes. Um, uh, native, uh, agriculturally critical, uh, moth pollinated, um, plants are, are this agave uh, is actually moth pollinated. These white flowers. Um, this is the agave moth, uh, the yucca moth, um, and um, this is one of the only uh, pollinators on the planet which pollinates on purpose. And this is because this little lady lays her eggs in the developing ovules of the yucca flower, and so she will very carefully take the pollen from one flower and put it on the stigma of another flower and then lay her eggs in those flowers. And they've developed this relationship over time where no one's you know, doing it too much. Um, and if you've got, I planted, we're outside of the real native range of yucca, but I've planted it at my dad's house in Connecticut and gone to check out these moths and the, the flowers in the summer and these little ladies are there. They're, they, so oftentimes we'll talk about that with the squash bee too, but when you move the plants around, the pollinators move with them well outside of the range. And you can see them in action, especially at night. These are, um, are in the evening time. They're, they're like hanging out and again, they're not, scared of me and I can pester them and take photos and post them on Instagram. So um, I highly recommend if you've got this plant growing, just check it out and you can see these ladies in there all the time. It's amazing. More yuccas. And then this, everyone recognizes this flower, right? Of course, this is nicotine, nicotiana. Um, and uh, this is obviously a very, very important uh, flower. And this is a moth pollinated flower and it's pollinated by hawk moths. Hawk moths, you might better know as the hornworm, your mortal enemy. Um, and uh, there's tomato hornworms and tobacco hornworms. And, um, 
and this is the larval phase of the um, of the hawk moth that is also the pollinator partner for this plant. So it's just good. Obviously, you're farmers. You need to do what you need to do to get your crop. I understand that. Um, but you should know that when you are trying to wipe out these guys, you are ripping apart these relationships that took thousands and thousands of years to evolve. These are very tightly integrated mutualisms that you are really trying to keep away from each other in a way that um, is uh, neither organism necessarily is, is super happy with. The, the hawk moth tobacco relationship is just as critical and elegant as the monarch milkweed relationship. It's identical, um, uh, except that Again, no plant wants to be eaten. No, there's not a, the tobacco is not thinking, ah, oh, ha ha, hawk moth, come and hornworm, eat my leaves and I know you will pollinate me, hurrah. Um, they know that when, and this is Datora, um, but I'll go back to this guy. When um, these white flowers are being pollinated um, by the hawk moths, but the foliage is being eaten too much, um, the nicotine plant actually has a strategy for dealing with that. Um, it uh, switches its pollination syndrome. It stops opening and blooming during the nighttime and starts blooming during the day. And the flowers shift from white to pink. And so what they're doing is moving from hawk moth pollination to hummingbird pollination or butterfly pollination. They literally just switch syndromes. If the predation is too high, on their leaves, they think, okay, great pollination, but this is too much, um, this is, there's too much of a drawback here, and so they switch in order to attract a completely different set of organisms, um, which again, you can see this happening outside. So I don't see many organisms. I wanna do their parasites by the parasites. Yes. Of the yep. I don't know if there's hot milk or butterfly Yes. That's definitely true, but I think that um, one of the things like this datura, which is also um, a night, a moth pollinated plant, there's a, one of these beauties in, um, in Brooklyn just down the street from me, and I hang out by it at night, <laughs> like my nerdy <laughs> self, and, um, and there are hawk moths that visit it. And so I would encourage you, like you might not have them, but like go hang out in the evening, like get a bottle of wine and like just watch and see, see, we talked about setting up parties to watch flowers and um, how fun and wonderful that is. And you could, you could do that. I've seen especially things like um, uh, geraniums and petunias, an evening patch of annual petunias is like hawk moth haven. They love that stuff. So, We're, um, we'll talk a little bit about bat pollination, but um, we- Oh, on the, on the moths. Um, yes, absolutely. They could be, yes. If you have a robust bat population, they could be eating your moths, certainly. Um, but, um, but yeah, bats are also important pollinators, not around here, but in tropical regions as well. We don't have, unfortunately, any bat pollinated um, flowers around here. Um, and then this is, um, this is a moth. Has anyone seen this, this moth? Mm -hmm. So this is a, um, a clear wing hawk moth um, and, uh, or, and it, or a hummingbird moth. And people often mistake them for hummingbirds. They hover just like hummingbirds. And this is Monarda fistulosa, the bee balm, um, wild bergamot. And, um, and it's, there's a red form, which is hummingbird pollinated. And then this light purple form, which is hawk moth pollinated. Um, and this is one of these plants that a lot of, oops, whoa, um, a lot of different organisms, bumblebees will very readily visit this monarda, but you can see that the reproductive organs of this plant are high above the heads of this bee. Um, and, um, and this one where when she puts her proboscis down and is drinking the nectar here, these uh, reproductive structures are actually gonna bop her on the head and she is the reproductive agent of this, of this flower. So you will see bumblebees visiting this flower all the time, but they're not necessarily pollinating it. It's a moth pollinated flower. Um, and then this is a, these are just some cool moths. This is called a plume moth, it's a stick mimic. And these are the things that these are here, I guarantee it, you just have to look for them. And then wasps. So wasps get a bad rep 
People are terrified of them. Um, I told you about their evolution, which is wonderful stuff. Um, they don't collect pollen. Uh, they, will, they are really after nectar and will sometimes eat pollen as well. Um, but people are really terrified of, um, of wasps, and they should not be. The vast majority of wasps are parasites, just like that, um, the one that goes after your tomato hornworms. They are laying their larvae inside the bodies of other organisms, and so they're not gonna bite you, right? Um, and they're teeny tiny. A lot of them are so, so tiny, you can't even see them um, unless you are very, very clearly looking. But these big wasps, unless there are a few populations of things like paper wasps and hornets that are really dangerous, and they, like uh, many swarming um, insects, are all clones, right? Those are all sisters of each other. And so they will readily sacrifice their own lives in order to preserve the genetic uh, heritage of their hive. And so they will sting you and they will seriously hurt you. And it makes sense for them to do that. They, they will, they're aggressive and they will, will harm you. These ladies, these giant wasps that you often see on plants have a very, very different life cycle. Um, they are essentially single mothers where they go out and they get a caterpillar and they paralyze it and they bring it back to their nest, be it uh, in a hole or in a tree or in a little container of mud, um, and they lay their egg on that, on that paralyzed animal and their, um, their egg eats that that animal, and so um, and so they, uh, if they if they if they bite you or sting you and you kill them, that's the end of their genetic lineage, right? Like that that's the end of it, and so they're not going to sting you. You can I have worked up the um, the bravery. Uh, this is one of their houses to pet this guy, um, gal, uh, the great blue uh, wasp and um, they're giant, right? Which is not to say they can't sting you. Like these, these uh, animals, if you grab one, my husband is an arborist and he was, if, has anyone seen a cicada killer? Yes. It's our biggest, our biggest wasp and they're parasitized and need to carry cicadas, so they are big. And my husband's an arborist and he was pruning a branch one time and by accident grabbed a cicada killer and it stung him. And, um, and it hurt so bad that his arm dropped and he had a handsaw and he sliced open his arm and he couldn't even feel the cut because his arm hurt so badly. <laughs> he said it was like getting hit by a bat. So it's a really different, like, you don't, you know, they are still very harmful, but you really need to work hard in order to get stung by them. These guys, on the other hand, they will really sting you. Um, the, the, hive, um, the hive wasps. Wasps are big pollinators of orchids, and orchids and wasps have really fantastic relationships where a lot of orchids have developed this incredible mimicry where they're either pretending to be females and the wasps will fly in and try and mate with the flower and in the process pollinate them, or they're pretending to be males and the wasps will fly in and bite the flower and then in the process pollinate them. <laughs> so this is really hilarious. Um, there's a wonderful guy at NYBG who does a whole talk on just orchid pollination and the Orchids are incredible tricksters, but of course the vast majority of them are parasitic. Um, and sadly, I don't have time to go into the, uh, the amazing story of fig pollination, which is effing crazy. And, but if I have time at the end, I'll tell you about it. Um, bees. Bees are the big one that everybody thinks about. Um, there's, oops, carpenter bees who are giant, giant, and sweat bees who are teeny tiny. So there's a wild diversity of bees. New York State has over 440 species of bees. Yes? Sorry, this, you might have answered this already and I forgot. Um, what is the benefit of, to a plant whose flower only has nectar if the, the insect eats the nectar? Why does that happen? Is it still helping the plant somehow? Yeah, absolutely. So normally um, that plant is, uh, there could be different things. There, like I don't have an easy answer, right? There's no easy answers. There's like, it could be this, it could be that. It could be a flower that's moving from sexual pollination to uh, selfing, right? It could just be in the process of changing that evolutionary strategy. It could be a flower that um, that is, um, uh, that is uh, providing nectar but has other individual flowers on the same plant that are, uh, that are giving off pollen. So it's a lure in some way and then it can be a bait and switch. But most often when you're dealing with um, organisms that are only after nectar and not pollen, 
uh, what they are also doing is, even though they're not eating the pollen of that plant, they're still distributing it. So um, they might be like a butterfly that lands on an azalea and is just drinking the nectar of that azalea. The anther of that, just because those anthers aren't having their pollen eaten, the anther is still hitting that butterfly, and that butterfly is still pollinating that, um, that plant. Um, and, then, and then something like a fly on an open pollinated plant that's just eating, drinking the nectar, they're still moving that pollen around. They're just not necessarily eating it, if that makes sense. Uh, so bees are so cute, right? They're just covered, their bodies are covered in hairs, the hairs are forked. These are the organisms that collect pollen. They uh, exclusively uh, rear their young on pollen, and so their bodies, the female bodies, are all made for gathering it. Um, there's long-tongued and short-tongued bees. Oh my gosh, I have 15 minutes left. This is, I'm so sorry, this is what always happens. <laughs> Um, long tongue, short tongue bees depends on the flower type. Um, this is a bumblebee uh, nest. There's all different types of bee nests. Some, some of them nest in the duff layer of leaves that you leave on the ground. That's why it's very important to leave those leaves on the ground. Uh, and the bumblebee cycle is such uh, that um, they emerge in the spring. Uh, the queens emerge in the spring. Uh, they fly out, they gather nectar and pollen, they go back and they lay their eggs and they create a team of sisters and then the burrow grows and grows over the course of the season. They uh, proliferate and then at the end of the season, the queen lays a generation of, uh, of males and then the next generation of females and then those uh, go out and mate, and then the males die and the females overwinter. So in the end of the season for, for bumblebees, you can see a lot of bees really slowly dying on plants um, because they're either um, females uh, that are not queens or the, drone, or the males, um, and it's just really the queens that are trying to overwinter and they're much bigger and really clearly different. And that's why it's important Bumblebees are one of the main reasons why it's really, really critical to provide floral resources, flowers blooming early, early in the spring and late, late in the fall. So that's another method of ecological gardening where you are trying to make sure that you have as many late flowering plants as possible. 30% of bees, only 30% of bumblebees make it through winter hibernation. And mostly that's because they don't have the, the pollen and nectar that they need. And so you really need to help that. Um, solitary bees, the vast majority of our native bees are solitary. They are not hive living or eusocial like the bumblebees. Um, our tiny little native bees, um, they live underground or in sticks or holes in wood. Um, and they collect a ball of pollen and nectar and they lay their larva and it grows and it turns into a bee and that bee flies out. and. Um, and they, um, they, don't, they aren't creating large colonies necessarily. They're, they're, in, they're solitary organisms. And there's a wide variety of different nesting strategies. Um, there's bees, these leaf cutters are incredible. They create little containers out of leaf cutters, uh, out of um, leaves and leave these beautiful circles. I like to think of them as ornamentation. Um, and then, and you can encourage all of these organisms in your, in your landscapes as well. You can leave tubes of hollow plants. You can cut back, um, plants later in the season, right? So one of the things that we do in ecological gardening is we leave all of our flower stalks up over the course of the winter. Uh, that's important for birds because they're eating the seeds. And then we also, in the spring, we cut back those flower stalks as late as possible because we know that these guys are living in those flower stalks. And normally when you have a couple days over 50 degrees, you can cut them down and know that they've already emerged from those flower stalks. And when we do cut them down, we do not gather all of the waste material and throw it in the compost. Um, that's a big difference between organic and ecological gardening. As much as possible, and it's not always possible, sometimes you're working in a formal setting or there's a, a enough stuff on the ground that you can't do this, but as much as possible, what we do in the park is cut the stalks in six inch chunks with a set of shears and leave them on the ground. Um, so that we're trying to maintain these populations of organisms in their environment. We need to cut things back. That's what we do. We're in horticulture. Um, but as much as possible, we're trying to maintain these environments of these organisms. Um, there's cuckoo bees. This is what a ground nesting bee nest looks like. This is really, really critical. And again, in horticulture, a lot of people are mulching. In agriculture, a lot of you are mulching. 
Um, but there's a lot of ground nesting bees that do not want your mulch and, and won't be able to nest around your plants if you mulch around your plants. They want to nest directly into the ground. So bare soils um, are really critical. And one of the big things uh, that's really important for, um, for uh, cultivating bee habitat is just being able to recognize it. Is uh, when you see the look first, see if you see these little holes in the ground, and when you do see them, hang out for five minutes and see what flies in and out, and see if it's something that is important for your for your plant material. These little digger bees are really fantastic pollinators. Squash bees live in the ground as well. Longhorn bees. Um, these are all those males asleep on the flowers. Uh, I guarantee this is happening in your garden. Um, you just need to look for it. Um, this is the squash bee. Oh, this is cutie, right? Um, and the squash bee, unfortunately we won't have time, but also I'll tell you the story now. Um, the, all of your cucurbits, melons, cucumbers, all of, all of those plants uh, are all pollinated by this guy, this gal. Um, there's one species of squash bee, and she and the guys too like, will live in those flowers, and they live right around the base of those plants in your garden. They're in holes in the ground. And when I taught this course for the interns this summer, we went outside and we looked at a squash flower outside and I was trying to show them the flower and I opened it, it, opened it up and the squash bee inside was like, go away! And I like, got all angry and zoomed out at, the, at the, all the interns. And so they're there again and they're, they are this adorable um, and you can, you can really just go visit them. And it's really critical to know that they are living in the ground right around your plants. Um, and so when you're tilling, when you're mulching, you are upsetting these dynamics. They're way better at pollinating your cucurbits than honeybees are and bumblebees are. These are the pollinator partners. And there's, again, this is just one species. And their range was really limited by the distribution of these plants. But as people moved these plants all over North America and up into Canada, the range of the bee moved with them. Um, so it's something that's, it's not necessarily native, but as we move these plants around, it's, uh, it's here as well. Green metallic bees, oh, they're so gorgeous. Um, and they're uh, often on, um, on uh, asters and echinaceas. Sweat bees, teeny tiny bees, they are drinking your sweat and landing on you. Um, and then there's also a wide variety of bees that are now being cultivated in agriculture. Um, and there's orchard bees uh, and mason bees. Um, these are leaf cutter bees. Uh, that these are all really. This is a leaf cutter bee doing her thing, carrying the leaf around. These are all really important bees for for especially um, rosaceous material. So any fruit trees, they found that uh, honeybees are not the most effective pollinators for a lot of rosaceous material. Honeybees are kind of lazy. Um, they will visit their, the, the generalist bee, right? That's why they've been able to travel all over the world is because they will eat absolutely anything. But they also are lazy. They only want to fly when it's perfect outside. They'll just visit the flower on the top of a group of flowers rather than all the flowers underneath. So if you have like a strawberry flower, um, the top one will get pollinated really well, but those underneath flowers um, are often pollinated by native bees. Um, so a lot, these are these leaf cutter holes. Um, a lot of people who have crops that um, rely on native bee pollination will have those crops and they might have honeybees there, but they also try and create um, habitat for those native bees in the surrounding areas around their properties because they, uh, so they can grow floral resources or use floral ground covers. Um, there's orchards that, um, I'll just bang through this stuff. Uh, I'm skipping so much cool stuff, but it's what it is. Uh, bumblebees, bang, 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 bang. Bumblebees are great. They live in the duff layer. That's an important thing. They're very important pollinators. Mason, uh, carpenter bees are really good pollinators as well. Um, this is a, a carpenter bee, uh, uh, what's called nectar robbing, um, biting a hole in this blueberry flower. And then you can see that they're eating the resources without actually pollinating the flower. A lot of bees do, will do that as well. Honeybees are especially really good nectar robbers. Um, and you can see this is a, a tubular flower that these bees are doing that. So honeybees are, are fantastic pollinators. They're generalist pollinators. They're not faithful. So if you have a wide variety of different flowers in your landscape, they're not very good at just pollinating one plant where a bumblebee is gonna fly 
um, from pea flower to pea flower to pea flower. And so are the blue orchard bees. They're going to go from rose to rose to rose. Uh, or apple to apple to apple, where the bees can go to the clover, to the apple, and so they're not as effective in pollinating that way. So a lot of people, when they do create these other floral resources, if they have an orchard, one of the techniques that they do to get more reliable pollination of those, of those uh, fruit, for those fruits is to mow their landscape when, uh, when the flowers that they want pollinated are, are in bloom. They'll mow everything else. Um, so that all the bees are just actively focusing on that one thing. That was Alexander the Great, who was entombed in honey. <laughs> Accurate picture um, from the internet. Uh, hummingbirds are so wonderful. They're birds, so they're going, they have these tubular flowers. They're not important for any uh, agricultural purposes around here. Pop quiz, I'm gonna skip, sadly, about like who are these guys and who's pollinating them. Um, who's pollinating this flower? This is an important quiz question. The answer is nobody. So this is a, uh, a cultivar of echinacea where all of the anthers have been turned into petals. Um, and so we really like it. Some people really like it and think it's beautiful, but it's not providing any floral resources. This is a native plant. This is the columbine that's pollinated by hummingbirds. And there are these little bulbs of nectar up here. And the hummingbirds will stick their beaks up there to pollinate in the most gorgeous, gorgeous ways that you can see the stuff happening in the spring. And this is the passion flower, an important agricultural flower. And I think that this is just such an amazing thing where you can look at this flower and be like, who the hell thought this was a good idea and why? <laughs> like, this is a crazy flower. And some bee was like, oh, no, no, I want these fringes. I want these like crazy <laughs> anthers. And I will accept nothing less than this. And so. Um, over thousands and thousands of years, this flower was literally just, you know, these random mutations. These bees are selecting out these morphological changes and thinking, oh, yes, this is the one that I want. And over time, it turns into stuff like this. And, um, and when you think to yourself, who would do this? There's, you can see that these bumblebees are visiting the flower, but they're not necessarily able to hit the reproductive structures of the plant up here. We have to thank this crazy Brazilian carpenter bee, this giant, giant bee for this ridiculous flower morphology that gave us the passion flower. Um, and again, I just love to think of these flowers as, as the manifested desires of these gorgeous plants, of these gorgeous insects. Um, and then you have interesting flowers like this. This is a penstemon flower that a lot of different bees will visit, but only one bee, this leafcutter bee, is doing the pollination work of that flower. Um, and there are people, again, on the internet, Heather Holm is a really fantastic person. Beatrice Moiseau has written a book, a free book you can download about bumblebees of Eastern United States. Um, and uh, about how to, um, how to uh, uh, identify and, um, and what these bees are doing with these plants. And now we're going to bang through. We've got, I think, seven minutes. Yep. Seven minutes. All right, we're going to go so fast. Tomato flower, buzz pollinated by this bumblebee. Bu a buzz pollination is also called sonication. It is a super cool thing that bumblebees can do and some solitary bees can do as well. What they do is they unhook their flight muscles from their wings and they use it to vibrate their bodies at middle C frequency. And it's an incredible, incredible ability where this, the pollen that's inside this tomato flower is released and explodes from that vibrating um, uh, frequency and then the bees able to collect it and the flower is able to pollinate itself. Uh, tomatoes do not uh, suffer from inbreeding um, suppression. They, they will breed with themselves over and over over time. So the bees are actually just creating this explosion with vibrating themselves to a certain frequency. And that they do that even on things like roses. They will still buzz pollinate, openly pollinated plants. Um, but um, and you can hear this. You can hear them flying around. I have some videos on my Instagram where a bee's flying and it's like buzz, and then it lands on the flower and it goes buzz. And it's a different, it's a totally different frequency. You can see this, you can see this stuff happening. And then in, um, uh, if, you are, if you are growing tomatoes uh, and you are in a greenhouse, people often uh, will release bumblebees in those greenhouses. And sometimes wind will hit that specific frequency and vibration and you can get um, uh, you can get uh, that vibration and pollination as well uh, but you can also do this by hand 
uh, but with any you know vibrating apparatus you may have around your house, um, you can see and see if you can if you can pollinate these flowers as well, uh, which can be a fun experiment. This is a pepper, same very. It's also uh, uh, in the nightshade family with uh, tomatoes. Uh, it has an open beak, but it's still the same kind of pollination. These are blueberry flowers, also buzz pollinated, even though they're uh, in a different family. Um, and there's a bumblebee doing it. Strawberries. Um, strawberries are pollinated very well by a wide variety of, um, of native bees, better than honeybees. And when you get poor pollination on a fruit like this, that's what it looks like. When you see those wonky strawberries, um, that's what's happening is that these flowers were not properly pollinated. The individual flowers need to be pollinated quite a few times to get um, a total pollination coverage. Um, and uh, same with raspberries. That's a poorly pollinated raspberry. That's, if you're getting a crop that looks like that, you need to create more habitat for native bees, and then um, you can get more uh, better fruit. They've even found that um, strawberries that are pollinated by wild pollinators travel better um, in, uh, in throughout grocery stores as well. Um, a lot of rosaceous trees like plums and um, apples and uh, peaches are pollinated now by blue orchard bees. Um, they, uh, they are way more active and way better at pollinating fruit trees than honeybees are. Honeybees can still have a role, but people have really moved into cultivating these um, in pretty incredible ways. Yes? don't know the answer to that because I've never actually grown them. So the question for the internet is whether or not traffic affects uh, the populations of your pollinators. I don't know. I know that habitat fragmentation definitely does. Um, and traffic is one method of fragmentation. Um, so I imagine that, yes, there is probably some sort of relationship. Um, but a lot of, so a lot of uh, farmers are starting to cultivate these these uh, other types of bees, and sometimes they're doing it in healthy ways, and sometimes they're doing it in ways that sort of mimic the unhealthy industrial patterns of cultivation that we've gotten into with honeybees that um, can actually be uh, quite harmful. These are the cucurbits. Um, I cannot tell the difference between these flowers of which, which one's a melon and which one's a cucumber, but maybe you can. Um, here's our little squash bee who I know for a fact is living right outside, um, and how cute they are. Um, this is an alfalfa flower, um, and uh, these are um, pollinated by uh, this one little oil bee. Um, honeybees don't like to pollinate them because the trap, when you, um, when you open this flower, it kind of hits the bees on the head, and the honeybees are like, ah, stop it, and so they nectar rob them. They won't get hit on the head, but these little oil bees that have evolved with the alfalfa, they're called alkali bees, um, they, uh, they're, um, they are the right pollinator for alfalfa. Peas are a mystery. No one's really figured out what's going on with pea pollination, um, but they think that they're mostly self-pollinated. Um, and then who recognizes this flower? It's a hard one. It's a grape flower. Um, and so it's like, totally abundant flower wind pollinated, so you don't see it. Although I guarantee you've all seen a grapevine, you just don't see it because it's not trying to attract animals, right? It's not trying to attract you, it's wind pollinated. But um, here's a little flower, here's our little grape flower. Um, interestingly enough, even though we don't rely on uh, uh, bees for, time's up, oh God, all right, meh. All right, I'll just finish this one. <laughs> um, we don't rely on bees for the pollination of our grapes for wine. Um, it has been shown that wasps that um, eat the grapes are actually doing a very critical job of transferring yeasts around from grape to grape that is absolutely critical for the fermentation of wine. Um, so um, they're not actively pollinating, but they're a big part of that production. All right, and we didn't get to how to encourage pollinators, which I'm so sorry, and I know how critical that is, right? <laughs> Kind of the whole purpose of the whole thing. And maybe I'll time it better next year. It'll give me a whole day. But um, take, uh, <laughs> yeah, right? It's hard to, well, it's hard to talk about it when you don't have all of that background. And it's obviously hard for me to pick 
and skim. Um, but know that in your handouts, you have a huge list of things um, that, uh, that we have to cut off from the internet. But if you're interested in hanging out, I can, just, I can also just like quickly bang through it.